Thank you. It is Thursday, September 13th, and this is the Town Council Management and Planning Session. I call it to order. All rise, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Uh, note that uh, Mayor Gore is at a mayor's uh, water quality issue function this morning and will return as soon as she's able to. Uh, first item for discussion, welcome. It's the Estero Boulevard Rehab Project update. Thank you for all the county and Tetra Tech staff and everybody who's here and uh, we're ready for your update. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, uh, Doug Muir, Assistant County Manager at Lee County. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, morning. everybody. Uh, I think this will be brief, right? The, the, uh, every, every obstacle for Segment 2 construction that they're working on right now is, is out of the way. So really, we're just uh, proceeding with uh, constructing the road. The, uh, the schedule may be pushed back a couple months, but the critical component that we've talked about before, which is that stretch in front of Red Coconut, we still anticipate a December completion before the high season uh, in that area. So the, some of the problems, we've had a little bit of trouble with some rain, uh, which will, will stall the paving, but for the most part, I think now we're, we're pretty stable. Uh, as far as the future segments, and I'm not gonna go through the numbers because there's so many three A's, three B's, segment four, things like that, but for the next, uh, for the next couple of sections or the next section, uh, we're close to coming to an agreement on the interlocal, which defines the delivery dates of the outfalls uh, in that particular area. And uh, once we have an agreement on that, then I think that kind of clears the way for everybody to, to move forward uh, with the construction. We anticipate our construction manager bidding uh, for that uh, next segment uh, sometime in December. So we should be ready to uh, start putting things together at the first part of, of next year to proceed forward on that. Our uh, design professionals are uh, really the, the, the final segment down to the bridge. Uh, that we anticipate that design should be completed uh, fourth quarter of next year, 2019, which keeps us on schedule then to move forward with that particular section. And uh, we still, our, our hope is still to uh, complete this in the uh, probably the, the third or fourth quarter of 2021 at our last monthly executive committee meeting uh, some things came up that are really uh, concerning in terms of the schedule and keeping everything on schedule so that's really been my primary focus here for the last couple weeks we have met uh, roger desjardins and i have met with the uh, construction manager we really want to define what our potential issues are and what our alternatives are to get through those so that we can keep this on schedule. And uh, we, we anticipate that within two to three weeks, we will have a list of alternatives. Uh, Roger and I will sit down with your Roger and kind of go over them so that we can uh, strategize and see if there are some things that we want to address the council uh, with in terms of, of keeping it moving as quickly as possible. So just want to give you a heads up that that's coming. And uh, I believe that's it. Thank you. Uh, let's start with you this morning, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, so, Doug, down at the last section, are, are, you, are we calling them, you're calling them segments, right? Yeah. The last segment, do you have an idea about the outfall down there yet? Um, I think that that's going to be part of the design. Uh, in, in that segment in particular, I think the majority of those outfalls are going to be county only outfalls so there are a few at the uh, in the northern part of that segment that we really haven't picked an alignment yet and we're probably going to need to do some easements on the furthest south part um, at bay beach we're going to need an additional outfall down there we've already started the conversation with them on where that alignment might be all right I, I I knew those guys were very concerned about that down there. That's why I was, so you are having conversations yes. with them. Um, one, one suggestion I would like to, to make, 
and uh, I mentioned it briefly to Kay back there, uh, is that if there was possible to do a segment map, I'm, I'm going to call it a segment map, and so you take like segment, current segment that's being worked on, and graphically show, like maybe monthly, what's finished and what's what's finished and what's under construction. So, you know, you, you might have the the sewer is completely done, the sidewalk is done to this point. Uh, we're starting in the center drain area. It, it, when we get these updates. There's a lot of detail to them, and a lot of it is boilerplate stuff to, to some degree. But to read all that, you still don't, when you get done, it doesn't give you a sense of where we are in the, in the process of the overall project for that segment, in my opinion. And if you could just do a little graphic representation, like, you know, maybe our water lines are 100% done down there, and, uh, you know, be a green line or dotted green line or what, whatever you do for that type of part of the process, uh, just illustrate it. I, I just think that would be helpful to people, at least it would be to me. And obviously you wouldn't do it just for me, but if you think that's a good idea, I'd be interested in having that done. I think it's a good idea, but we'll talk to the staff. I don't think that's a problem. I know we've got some graphics and it'd just be some simple modifications. Hmm? Anita. I, I love this idea, if, even if it could be like a Google map kind of thing, if it was, um, I mean, I don't know if there, well, there has to be a way if there's, you can think about it, somebody can do it. Um, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Uh, n you know, uh, Doug, I just said at the last meeting how much I appreciate it on behalf of a lot of those businesses there at the Red Coconut and, and um, Gulf View shops getting that corner. Uh, sort of moving. They've been panicking a lot. It's been a difficult summer, as we all know, and um, so it's great to see that moving forward. And uh, I, I just appreciate the fact that it keeps moving forward. Your team is fantastic. So thank you for that. Yes. No. Well, of course I do. <laughs> uh, first, I wanted to just, uh, say thank you to Jesse Lavender and uh, Dave Horner. Uh, they met uh, yesterday with um, um, Roger and I, and we did go over um, some things with the uh, uh, beach accesses and, and uh, Crescent Beach Park. So I just wanted to say on the record, thank you. Um, do you actually have a, a, a date for when the sidewalk will be complete um, in front of, in, from the segment from Denora to Lover's Lane on the bay side? Because that will be great when that sidewalk connects all along there. We need to get that. Aaron Brown with Christelle, for the record. <clears throat> the sidewalk that goes from Denor to Lover's Lane, uh, that's a, uh, the area where the right-of-way goes back down to 50 foot. So we've got the sidewalk done up to the wider right-of-way point. We're going to pave the lane and put a temporary asphalt sidewalk in on Friday and Monday of this week. So you'll have a full pedestrian way all the way to Lover's Lane and today Monday. When we build the actual road, go from, once that lane is done, we'll go to the center, we'll go to southbound. We have to come back to do the concrete in that area because it's only 50 foot wide. So I can't put the curb in right now because I don't have enough room to get traffic through there. So to create the pedestrian way, I'm going to pave all of that all the way out to the right-of-way line and that will be a solid surface sidewalk until I can come back and get the last little bit of concrete in there. Because uh, on the bay side, that's a straight line. It, the, it expands out on the beach side, though. That's it, it, where it, it kicks on both sides, actually. The right of way, um, the way it comes through there, uh -huh. it, on the beach side, it kicks in. Uh -huh. And that's what narrows the whole roadway down. So with only 50 foot, I don't have enough room to put the curb and the sidewalk in, build the lane, and then do the other two lanes. There's not enough room for traffic. Um, we would have to reduce the lanes down to very narrow, and that's just not feasible. So we'll pave it to the right-of-way line. We'll move the traffic over, build across, and then come back, and then tie that last little bit of sidewalk in will be the last part of the work. But the sidewalk on the beach side will be 100% complete at that time, so there'll be a place for pedestrians to go while we take care of that last little piece. 
Very good. Thank Lauren, you. Lauren, could I piggyback Absolutely. on that for a second? Uh, Darren, so when that sidewalk is complete in front of the Gulf View shops, uh, is it going to be a curbed sidewalk? There'll, there'll be, uh, it's called a drop curb in that area, so they still have access to okay. their parking. It won't be a raised curb like you see everywhere else. Okay, so that pe people will be pulling in to park Correct. across this Driving sidewalk. Driving across the sidewalk, Great. Correct. Thank you very much. Thanks, yep. Joanne. Is there going to be enough room for parking ahead of time? Um, barely, but there is. We've made sure the measurements were there and all that. They have the required depth for the parking that they have right now. All of the right away. Um, the sidewalk is in the right away. The parking will be from the right away line up to their building, and there is enough room by parking space requirements for it to fit. Yeah. Is it still the the straight in parking, or is it going to be an angle? Just straight. Parking? Straight in. Still oh. straight. Hmm. Just the same orientation it currently has. Oh, well. Take their grade out and get the nose of the cars in under. <laughs> right. Um, Thank you very much on that yes, question. Um, we have uh, talked about doing a comprehensive meeting. We talked about that in June regarding crosswalks, railings, uh, landscape. Um, when can we schedule that? We'll make that part of our <clears throat> discussions over the next uh, two or three weeks because, uh, again, I, I want to really focus on schedule, but I'll bring up the, uh, the crosswalks and railings, and we can maybe make that a, a component. And, lands and landscape, you said you might have somebody from the county who would come and give us some options about the landscaping. I know they threw the, the sod in for now along there, but um, we had talked about that. And you'd said that there was a, uh, about a million dollars in, in the um, initial plan for some that's discussion. So I believe that's what it is, yeah. So it's can we include that in with that as well, please? Um, Again, and I know that Rogers had a conversation with our, um, the, the, the person handles landscape in our, our traffic division, our operations division. <clears throat> and we just really don't, we're not landscape architects. And I think what, what you would like is outside what would be our core service. So my expectation was based on that conversation that, that the suggestions might be coming from, from the, the beach side as opposed to us laying out the options, and I'm not sure where, where that was left, Roger. Um, well, where it was left, at least to my recollection, was that, uh, as I suggested to the council to look at uh, Old 41 and Old Bonita, um, that landscaping that they had there uh, is sort of a you know, way to picture in your mind what we could theoretically um, have uh, along our right-of-way. Again, it's a, it, it, is, it does have a medium, but it also has landscaping on the, on the edges of the sidewalk, uh, kind of a similar situation there. And the feedback I got from most of you is who, who had responded to me was that that's kind of a concept that's worth pursuing. I shared that with uh, Doug's colleague at the county, and uh, the last information that I got from him was that he was going to contact the um, we need a beach and to get see if you can get a copy of their plans and then have some internal conversation on whether we can just use a portion of that plan or whether we need to re-engage uh, a landscape architect, either the same one or a different one using that plan as a model to kind of try to develop develop some further concepts. So that's that's my understanding. So who <clears throat> so then who would uh, try to get that copy at this point? I'll check and see where it's at Will if, you talk? If, if Bill is committed to get it. Okay, thank you very okay. much. Mm -hmm. um, Comcast polls. When we last got together in June, you said they were going to be transferring the lines over. They still aren't. It looks terrible and it's unsafe. And if they try to take them out during season, we don't want to wait a whole other year. If we try to take them out during season, that really creates problems. So what's up with that? What's the delay? <coughs> Bob knows. Uh, Rob Phelan, Lee County DOT. Um, in anticipation of that question, I had a conversation this morning with FPNL. Um, they've had some contracting issues with some of their their contractors to come and actually remove the pole. Um, they got that resolved. They got the pole removal on their schedule, and most of their crews have are planned to be mobilized up to North Carolina. So 
So I'm sure we all understand the impacts that the storm can have. Um, as soon as they get free up there, they'll crews will start filtering back down to to Florida to do some of these relocations. He has committed to me that if there's anything that specifically needs to be removed to facilitate construction, that they will schedule that immediately. So another reason for us to pray for the Carolinas not to get hit too Correct. hard. All right, are we at the top of the list for when the crews are not in Carolina and uh, they're back? He didn't, he didn't say that, but he did commit to relocating anything that needs to be relocated that's in the way of construction activity. He, and he did assure me that it is, it is secure. Facilities are secure. Some of the problem is, and, and it will change over a period of time, but when we've moved the road toward the beach side, you know, so we can do utility, uh, the work itself, um, the people on the Estera Boulevard beach side can't see past all these poles to get out safely. I think it was you one day that stopped persuading that I didn't get hit, but honestly, you ease out, you roll your window down because people honk at you, but you're trying to ease out to see, and you just can't see. the. P when you got two poles now, you got a wall, well, and the road is right against yeah, where if, you're trying if, to pull out. If you've got specific locations, and, and you know, um, please have staff forward that to me. Okay. And we can have a conversation with them, if it, especially if it's a safety concern. Yeah, I'm worried. There's a few locations along there, especially okay. that curve by um, Lazy, Lazy Way. Way. Mm -hmm. It's it's difficult there anyway, but now with the road right against you and then the the line of double poles, it's almost impossible. So I know there's a series of houses there, and I can talk to some other people and see who has if there's any yeah. other real safety issues. Yeah, and usually Thank they you. like to do about ten poles if they're going to mobilize in. They like okay. to because because it, it's not just bringing a small crew in; they bring in that big crane that they use right. to to pull the poles. I'll, so. I'll see if there is that need, okay. if there's if there's 10 that, that can justify well, don't, don't, it. I don't understand. worry about the number. If there's a safety concern, let me know. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see, we did that one. Um, oh, this, uh, Doug, I guess this is a question for you. I noticed you are, and you, you talked a little bit about it with Bruce, but you said, I know we're at about 60% design, according to the records, for Buccaneer Lagoon. Um, and I guess I just have a question. Are you still feeling strongly that um, we're going to be able to stay with 30-inch pipes there? Or are you getting concerned that we'll be going larger to the 36-inch outfall, 36 inch outfalls? <clears throat> okay, I'm not aware of the details of, of that. Rob, are you aware of it? Again, Rob Phelan. Mm -hmm. um, they actually haven't gotten to the actual hydraulic sizing of the those specific outfalls. Right now, they're trying to utilize the in their preliminary design the uh, 30 inch size criteria. So you so haven't abandoned the 30, 30 inch. We have yet. not abandoned the idea. If, if if we need to go to 30 inch because we aren't able to get sufficient outfalls, you know, that's that's one of the tools that may we may have to use. Now, and you're saying that those would be uh, county outfalls if they are? If, would they, if they go to 36, I'm concerned about whose outfalls these are because well, well, the financial impact for the town. We, you know, there are several locations, especially at the south end, that are 30-inch outfall, uh, that are, uh, are county-only outfalls, uh, especially the Estralita area. Um, and, uh, you know, those are, those are the options that we would look at. And, and you said how soon do you think you might know that? Uh, they're they're starting the detailed hydraulic design now, so it may be a couple months before we have. More so maybe by our next report, then perhaps um, our next update. We may have more information by the next update. Okay. Another thing came up. Sorry, I, I have a list because people have given me a list. Um, lighting near Times Square. People are concerned about that, and I'm wondering when we get along that that section of Acero Boulevard, uh, or I, when we talk about lighting. Um, I just want to mention to you, you don't need to even respond right now, but people are concerned about um, safety and security in that area. So when we get our meeting together about lighting and crosswalks or different things, um, I just want to let you know, maybe you can be thinking about that. Um, let's see. Um, oh, the signs to the park and ride. You'd, that was great that you put up the one. I was wondering, we had talked about whether they'd be one somewhat earlier so people have a chance to get left. Is that something that might transpire? Because we really want that to be successful, the park and ride. I know that question's come up. I talked to Dave Arner late after, 
late yesterday afternoon and he was going to look into it. He, he oversees transit. Okay. And so that they're still pursuing maybe having one earlier. Yeah, he was going to check. Okay. Um, and then there's one last thing, and I got another, um, some feedback from several people actually with regard to um, safety at uh, Seafarers Plaza, and that um, there's uh, unfavorable activities that are happening inside there, um, and that are people are concerned about, but they also mentioned that the safety gates have been left open from time to time. So I just mentioned to you, that to you so that you're aware that people in the community are have that concern and um, that's all for me then thank you well, may I tag on to your question yes. uh, mm -hmm. Doug can can you confirm with regard to seafarers where you know we're on schedule in terms of um, abandoning that as a staging site or, or if there's any changes to the schedule as pertains to that right now it's scheduled for the end of the calendar year based on my recollection Yes. Yay. Okay, well, well, clearly, I, I think I can speak for council that that if if it's a day sooner, we'd be happy. Um, you know, we're, we're progressing with other properties in that area to try to sort of get that corner uh, more aesthetically pleasing. So, <clears throat> if there's any capability to do it a day, an hour, a minute sooner, we'd appreciate it. I think that's a fair. Uh, Roger, comment. thank you so much for saying that. And maybe this is a good opportunity right now for us to talk about. When you're done, what that will look like. Obviously, will that metal fence still keep, stay up, but we'll have the screening down so that we still get sort of a beach view. What will the surface be left like? Because uh, the county is the owner. Um, I mean, is the county, uh, is the council interested in that discussion for a moment? Some feedback from you, would you know well, we what we could expect? We haven't even discussed it. We had. Uh, We've talked to FDOT a little bit about some of the, the options of utilizing that property for some pedestrian facilities, <clears throat> we, uh, but we haven't come to any conclusions and really don't have, uh, haven't decided anything right now. Well, and, and um, actually, I, um, I'm the point person for the council to meet with Commissioner Kiker. I talked to him last week. He said that he's working, they're trying to get some plans together. We're going to get together as soon as possible with regard to and those kinds of issues. But the, the truth is, even if we decide on doing whatever we do, transportation or otherwise, I doubt that it'll be done at the time that that, that site is finished with. So I guess what I'm saying is for season upcoming, um, would you get with with Roger perhaps and you know look at our code for vacant properties or what has to be done and can we kind of look forward to maybe having the screening down and having so that I mean, it's been a long time that the entrance to this community, which is the number one TDC producing funds, and we've got water quality issues, and we want to be, we want to have our welcome mat open for season this year. We really want it to look nice. And uh, actually, the property at Ocean Jewel is coming down at the end of the month. They are going to sod it, and they may indeed put a touch of light landscaping, perhaps. Uh, just to low something not to block the view but to give a little more aesthetic appearance and so we need to know that we're not going to have you know what we have then at seafarers also and it's huge I don't know it's just huge to our community would you agree Anita? Well, it's absolutely huge it's a, to me it's a it's an enormous disappointment that um, our town is in a stall and um, uh, and so I, I, I'll, t I'll tell you what, people are going to be very quick to blame the county for the stall, for the look, and whatever, and that's not who is to blame. So um, uh, I'll, I'll be sharing that information with as many people as I can. But I think what Joanne is saying is something that we're all concerned with is once that, once that Ocean Jewels building comes down, what are we looking at? And what we're looking at is a pretty uh, derelict parcel so I am particularly not anxious for the Ocean Jewels building to come down for that very reason because I think it diminishes the view until we know what's happening with seafarers but it's scheduled for the end of the month and uh, maybe that will make the seafarers parcel move along a little faster I don't know um, we'll, we'll put that on the agenda and discuss it at our monthly meeting that would, be great. that would that would be great and uh, we understand I mean I, I think it's obvious we understand we don't expect a huge 
input of expense on the part of the county. That's no, not wise for ta taxpayer clean, funds. Cleared and if it was cleaned and cleared and maybe the screening was down so there's not a yeah. safety of what's going on behind those screens after dark. But you know, here's the other thing though. Once that's cleared, then what have you got? Then you've got the back side of the old Helmrich Plaza. Do you know what that looks like? It's ugly. Well, maybe it's hideous. I w that it just, can talk about, yeah. until, until it's all complete, we, this, this community lives with a huge, big fat blemish. And um, you certainly are not responsible for that, Doug, nor is anybody in the county. Um, so hopefully, little by little, it will all change. Maybe that's a good reason to even leave screening in an L shape. So you don't look past the back of the property, but the front's open and gives a sense of open space. You guys talk we'll about it. it. <laughs> thank you so much. Anything else? All right, thank you everybody for your time. Thank really you. appreciate it. And we love seeing the progress on the project. It's just exciting. Uh, next item. Yes. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Roger, can you tell me where we're at with the water lines? <coughs> I haven't seen any work on a sterile boulevard on water lines in quite some time. So where are we finished to? At what, po at what point are we completed with water lines? So Not the side streets, it's sterile boulevard. Right. So uh, the council, the council um, may remember that, uh, that you approved, you recently approved the contract extension for, uh, I believe it's 3A if my memory serves me correctly. Um, so that work is underway. We're continuing to coordinate with the county. Our issue on the water line on the is really, I believe, I just got on the pages here, but we're doing potholing which micro, to, to uh, confirm the size of pipe we can put in there. So there's actually um, work going in to, before you saw the full-fledged installation of pipe, but there is ongoing work in phase 3A already. Where are we completed to? We're completed to, what's that street? I don't know. Madeira Road. Anything else on this topic? All right, let's move to the next item, which is the uh, Aberdeen joint outfall. And who wants to lead this discussion? Um, well, I'll, I'll leave it off. I'll, I'll leave it off. <clears throat> we have, we were contacted by some neighborhood residents regarding um, the desire to perhaps uh, truncate uh, the project from its original outfall location um, to see if uh, we could um, perhaps save some money and uh, save some neighborhood inconvenience. We uh, attempted to, and I'll say attempted because there's some questions as to how successful that effort was, but we attempted to solicit uh, residential feedback as to their feelings about it. And um, that the, the net result is, is that there's a desire by uh, a good portion of the residents um, to, to, to try to uh, have that occur. The, the, the problem is that the alternate location for the outfall uh, goes, uh, the easement there is not wide enough. So we would have to get the owner on either side, on that, on one side of it to give us a, uh, either a permanent or temporary easement for construction purposes. That's problem one. Problem two is the current day have a non-compliant structure built over that easement that would have to go as part of that, us utilizing that easement. Considering that the council has previously taken a policy that we don't purchase easements, at least at this point, for the project, it comes down to whether or not uh, that individual is willing to um, give us the additional area. Assuming the best case that they were willing to do that, then we would have to uh, modify the design and, uh, and re-permit and, um, and I'll let Tetra Tech um, perhaps speak to some of the complexities of doing that. Tim, do you want to handle that? Yeah. Tim Vanderwalker with Tetra Tech for the record. Good morning, Tim. Good morning. Uh, some of the items that we've identified as far as an alternative design which would continue Either design would include a connection at Aberdeen and Estero and 
go down Aberdeen. Uh, this alternative design would continue on uh, through this property um, or through uh, what's platted right of way for a ditch in that area. Um, at the end is a structure, as Roger had mentioned. Um, there would be a permitting effort that would be required. We would need to update the design and send that on to the Water Management District for their information, which it, it has been a pretty quick turnaround. Um, I'll give them that. Uh, the other permitting agency is the Army Corps, which we have, we have done a, a resubmittal um, in this process, um, which went faster than a normal original initial submittal, but it did have some turnaround time related with that. Uh, we would anticipate that'd be about a three month delay to the project to do that permitting effort, the design and the permitting effort to get those. As far as the obstruction of the boathouse, since we would be upsizing the outfall, we would need to replace the seawall that's in that area and is covered by the boathouse. So some demolition, either full demolition or parcel dem demolition, it's an older structure, so that would need to be evaluated. Um, as well as an environmental audit of the structure to make sure that there's no lead-based paint or asbestos or anything, uh, just depending on the age of the structure, um, what might be in there. So that's that's an unknown at this point. It would need to be evaluated and determined. So just to, just to, just to um, advise the council, one of the reasons why uh, Lee County is hanging around because obviously, you know, if we were to move into the alternate, there you know, so there's some delays that that Tim has related to you that you know further impact impact the complexity of of coordinating all of our side streets with the county schedule as, as the tie-ins and all of that. So, um, you know, uh, it's a shame that perhaps that this didn't get identified ba way back when, when the plans were revealed, what, a year or so ago at, um, at um, Bay Oaks. But um, we had a request from the residents. We went out there, we talked to them, we looked at it, we, we try to get feedback. Um, as I said, uh, it, it wasn't overwhelming to change plans, um, but there are very, some very vocal people who would like to see us change the plans. And uh, absent direction from council to, to spend time, money, resources of the town and Tetra Tech to try to secure uh, additional um, easements and the complexities of uh, looking into the complexities of, of removing the boathouse and the seawall work, et cetera. Um, well, we won't do that until obviously you direct us to, do, to, to go ahead and spend money and effort to, to do those things. Yeah, um, Bruce. Okay, so on Dundee, was, was Dundee, or sorry, yeah, Dundee, was that determined to be a street with flooding issues at all? Just to remind you, Councillor, that the streets that we're putting the um, outfalls on behalf of the Cerebola were intentionally picked to be the dry streets for, for the purposes of um, constructability and um, et cetera. So um, most of the streets that we're putting the side street outfalls are, are not, they're not the streets that have um, currently have uh, flooding issues. All right, so when you look at this petition or survey that was put out, it says if, if, they voted to, if they voted for the alternative plan that would not have the stormwater coming down Dundee, it says uh, we do not want new water and storm drainage. When, when I look at that survey, that seems to tell me that they don't want new water lines. But does it, our intent would be to put the water lines in later, you know, five years, three years, whatever? That's that, the, the point with respect to that is, is that we're committed to up, upgrade the water lines throughout the town, including that street. The problem is, is that if, it, if that's the only work that's being done on that street to upgrade the water lines, it goes from its current number one priority 
to an unknown priority with unknown date that I can't even project as right. to when we would be there to uh, install water lines. Okay, but but it doesn't mean that they won't ever get water lines. It's just unknown when it, it comes. It, it, it's just so unknown that I, uh, you know, we felt hesitant to, frankly, to even necessarily promise it in some people's lifetime, some of the residents' lifetime, you know, because we just don't know. When they go to put them water ins at a time unknown, it's going to be considerably more costly than it is doing it right now. Right. Well, it'll, you know, every every uh, time we have a change order or theoretically or a new contract, prices are escalating. So you know, the, the further out it is. But it's not just that. It's, it's If it's 20 years down the road, the cost of putting up water lines in then is going to be considerably more expensive than if we, well, we have the crews out there going street by street doing it. Anything, anything that's pushed off the future will be more expensive. So, that's I correct. Mean, if they don't want the water lines, are they willing to kick in the extra money? Uh, we didn't ask them that question. Yeah, I didn't figure. Um, and I'm, you're saying I, you're saying that there's there's considerable amount of the neighbors that want it. I'm looking at this survey. You got ten that say yes, ten that say no, and fifteen that don't care. That didn't bother to turn in the survey. That doesn't sound like a majority of the owners on that street. Well, I don't know if I use the word majority, but I would say the the more vocal folks. So, uh, local, but there were still only 10 of them and 10 and 10 and 15 that don't care. Right, you know, and then you, un unfortunately, the ones who are vocal uh, then are now, you know, questioning, you know, how the survey was worded versus, you know, what the results showed, which was that basically um, there's support for the change, um, but the, the, the real problem is, is that what looks to them to be a very simple thing, and that is just you know, move it here, is a lot more comp complex and will require a lot more effort and, and time to do that. And we have a whole project behind that one street. That's not, this is not a project of just doing that one street, and there are, there are not other pieces that are being impacted by how quickly or, or slowly we do that street. There are other elements involved with that. For the, for the sake of expediting the discussion, I think that we have the obvious one side, which is stay with because. And so I'm going to provide <clears throat> everything I know about the counter argument, and then we can decide. How's that sound? Which counter argument? <laughs> well, oh. the idea of using the shorter, going to the alternative plan, which does not go up Dundee. So just a question to answer, because to me, the, t the questions here are time and money. Okay, it gets down to time and money from my point of view. So time, um, it's not good to go to the alternate plan and shorten it because there might be a delay. So I'm going to get to the money issue then. And, and, and it is unfortunate because there are three outfalls there and there was only one identified in the original plan and, and it might have made a difference. There's no point in going back on that though. Um, but what I look at is the original projection for the cost on Aberdeen was given at um, $195,000. It was a $65,000 $65, piping and $130,000 sediment box. And that was uh, called MI3 or M13, whatever. But then when it, and it was, uh, but then when it changed to Aberdeen, Lauder, and Dundee, it had not, um, uh, when it became the joint outfall that way, it was listed as $515,000. So from my point of view, I'm, I'm wanting to know um, what the facts are here. Because one looks like 195,000, <clears> which could have gone up a little bit, but, and the other looks like 515, which to me is at a $250,000 difference, let's say, or something, allows us to do another street that does flood by, by doing this. And the individual <clears throat> whose boathouse is there was aware at the time they purchased it that that was on an easement and might have to come down. I'm not unsympathetic to that individual, but I'm, um, it's just a point that needs to be made. So that being said, I guess my question is, what's the true cost of the change? Is that accurate, that it started out at 195 for the short one, and it's at 515 for the current plan? So can somebody well, respond well, to that? I think we'll, we'll, have, we'll see if we can get someone who can to respond to those numbers, but let me just remind you about this before we just start dissecting the number. And that is, is that 
someday unknown in the future, as Council Bobak mentioned, that water line will be going in, so that comes off that number. You're just talking about money today versus money later. Secondly, even if we don't put stormwater down that street, at some point that street will have to be rehabilitated anyway, and that also would have to come off that number. Now, those are future numbers, and I can't even predict as to it's not a three-year number or a five-year number or a seven-year number. It's just, a, it's just be recognized that eventually, someday in the future, the water line will go in and that street will have to be rehabilitated. So those things would come off that number. So at the end of the day, what you're talking about, the delta, is just that street would not have stormwater um, going down it. And that's the cost avoidance that would occur if we did go to the alternate plan. And I don't know if anyone has any information in here to estimate what that number is. Absolutely, Anita. There's, there's, also, there's also the collateral costs of, in the last however long this has been going on, how much staff time has been devoted to this? How much, what costs have been incurred in conducting or calculating what an alternate plan was? You know, if you look at who has signed I want the alternate plan, there are several lifetime friends of mine who would like the alternate plan, and I will not move to the alternate plan because this is a comprehensive stormwater project. And if we continue to have these what I'm going to call derailments because someone doesn't like it, then we're going to continue to delay the other 7,000 people that live on this island who are tired of living with this. We've got to continue to move on. I understand that we want to meet with neighborhoods and we want to talk to them and we want to listen to what they want. But when we do that, we must take into consideration the other seven or 8,000 plus people who are saying, please, town council, move it, move it, and stop delays. I, it doesn't matter what number they give me, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to side on the edge of changing the plan because three, six months in government time is a year or two years potentially. And then to backtrack on top of that, forget it. It just, it derails everything. I'm sorry that there are some, uh, some individuals, namely friends of mine, who aren't happy with this notion, but it is, a, it is an island-wide project and we're all in it together. I didn't like it coming down my street either, but I'll tell you what, the end result on my street is fantastic. So Anita, so, you, you're with the current plan. I am with the current plan, Dennis. not wavering. Dennis. I'm with the current plan as well because if we if we if we change it and we got to go back and do it later, it's going to cost us twice as much as it does now. And yes, it's going to inconvenience some people, like everybody else so far has been inconvenienced. But in the end, it comes out a lot better for everybody. Bruce, I'm, I'm, that's where I'm at. I wouldn't do anything that delayed a Cerro Boulevard five minutes. In so a, you're on the current plan. Current plan. We have three. Let's move on. And, and you know what else? I think we really need to have make a policy decision that unless there is a health, safety, welfare, or baby Jesus moment that we've got to change the plan, we stop this because this, how much money are we spending right this second with all of these people who are, how much time are we, how much money is sitting here right this second? A lot. Just our own staff time. Anita, you make, you make a very valid point, but I think that you also made a valid point earlier that you said it is important we engage the neighborhoods. It so, is. And so I think that the part of it is none of this last minute engaging the neighborhood. We need to be ahead of the ball, which means that we, we, that's why we'd like to know what's happening at the south end. We'd like to know. We need to know ahead of time so we can have these conversations and not be saying, Shall we do this and delay the project? We want to know so we have time to do these things. And being so that truthful would be the thing. with the neighborhood when <clears throat> the neighborhood could have been told a month or two months ago that, hey, you know what? I know you're upset about this, but I'm sorry. Look at what the over the far reaching effect of it is instead of what's transpired. Anyway, thank you thank all you. very much. Thank Keep you, everybody, for um, coming today. Thank you. <clears throat> Get back to work because we need the project done. Thank and I'm you. sorry, John, because you're one of the ones that will. <laughs> I mean. Uh, next, Thank you guys. Uh, we'll let everybody just take a moment. Does the town council need a three minute break or anything? You're all right right now? Good. Um, next item is um, 
uh, discussing the square footage rental rates and rate structure of the Times Square Sidewalk Cafe. That is uh, item number C. Um, who wants to open this one? Roger, did you want to do that? Could I just ask a question, though? We've been asked to kind of delay these until we have like a joint work session um, from the, wasn't that the essential notion of the email that we received from Mr. Gucciardo? Uh, I, I would be all in favor of have this is this is a very complicated comprehensive I'm gonna have to recuse myself from these not from the discussion but from the ultimate vote because not from the cafe part because I don't have that opportunity but from the trash um, but I really would like to have a group meeting and um, and afford ourselves a historical present forward-looking uh, conversation on this and not just a rudimentary discussion. Great. Uh, uh, yes, Bruce. Sorry. Uh, are you proposing to have the merchants, I'll call them, of Times Square meet with the staff or with us? Oh, I think what is, what's actually being proposed from what I, ha what I personally as a business owner in <laughs> Times Square have been asked to do we have been at, we have agreed to um, contract Mr. Gucciardo, which is a good person because he was with it from day one, um, to more or less represent this group of businesses. That's a very smart move uh, on the part of the businesses because then you don't get bogged down in a lot of, it lets him do all the sure. grunt work. Got it. Um, so I would guess that maybe there would be some present. I don't know. Maybe you'd like to hear from John if he's had any conversations or Chelsea. They just had a meeting. Do you know anything more about this? Well, or first, Rogers, of, first of all, for the M&P, we don't normally have public comment. So I yeah. need to first okay. of all. Um, so skip John. Chelsea and Roger yeah. probably know everything. Well, thank you. Well, we received, we received the same email that the council received. So that's what we, we know so far. <clears throat> um, I think you all, and I, I, I know I could speak for myself, I've demonstrated a willingness to meet with anybody about any subject, whether it's for a representative or, or have the whole group and it's fine with me. Um, so, and I'm, and I'm open and more than willing to do that. However, I want, I want to be clear that this really is not, this is not really a negotiation. We all, we all care about Times Square and we all want to make sure it works well for everybody who, who, who's a stakeholder involved in Times Square and that's the people who operate businesses there, the people who live in the area, the people who don't live in the area and the very last person who lives at the south end before you go off the island. Everyone here in town has a stake in Times Square. That being said, I do think that the council needs to begin to at least set some parameter for us to sit down and, and if you want us to talk to them, to talk to them about from the town's perspective. Um, to have a joint conversation where, where there is no council input slash sense of where you would like to go, basically, will result in the, the old game of guess a number between one and a thousand, sure. 22, wrong, try again. And we won't really be able to make any progress. So I do think that um, the council needs to, to discuss the item and come to a, po a position that you're somewhat comfortable with. And then, you know, I think at that point is to reach out to them and understand the impacts, uh, uh, the potential impacts of that decision before the council actually finalize it, finalizes it and puts it into effect. Roger, I, I totally, I concur with what you're saying and what Anita says and with what Mr. Gucciardo said in his email. And to do that, I totally agree, Roger, that we should discuss this, begin to set a, a parameter for the, for the discussion, and then they get together based on what we, what we talked about. I think that that's the most effective means of communication. And uh, so I personally would like to discuss this, um, get some facts on the, the table today, get some point of view here, and then someone, either a designee, you, whatever, if we want to do a town council designee, how, how we've done with 
uh, the it really storm water. Be me. No, I, I know <laughs> it can't. It can't be no, you. So no, we'll, we'll I see if somebody uh, else, yeah. and um, if somebody else will be willing to do that, that's great. So, um, do, do other people want to discuss this as well and yeah. begin to? to and, and do you agree with that too? Well, we've got two, so we're discussing. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, who wants to start? I'm willing to start, or I'm willing to let Go anybody ahead. else start. Okay, I'm going to just jump in feet first, and I'm going to say first of all. Uh, that uh, Roger made a great point. This is the, the, the people of the entire town. Every taxpayer on this island own Times Square. So um, we have, all of us have a vested interest in this, and all of us love it. I don't think I would have moved to Fort Myers Beach if Times Square and that fun stuff didn't exist. I didn't want to go to a sleepy island. I wanted to go to a fun and funky island. So. We all want that area to succeed. As a matter of fact, we want it better and better and better. So let's let's start off with that. We want to work with the merchants to make all this work. I think that's important. Looking at the rental rates, uh, there's two topics really, and I'm wondering, is it okay if we should we just talk about rental rates first? Then we're going to talk about rental rates first. I think there's no doubt that these rates need to go up. Um, it's interesting, the, the chart that they came out with these different options of the rented square feet, if you look at that chart and you just do the math, basically if you look at that compared to um, uh, option two, which is sort of just the, uh, or the option where um, it would be, um, that was the consumer price index. Option two is like C Grape Plaza, okay? Nine dollars a square foot, right. Um, right now, basically, they're paying 40% of the um, of the uh, of a uh, town rate, and I personally don't include Santini. I think that that's kind of, from my point of view, that's on the high end. I'm just putting my thoughts out there because that's what we're doing here. But I think that there's no doubt that the rate needs to go up, and I think there's no doubt that you don't jump from where we are right now to where we'd like to be in one year. That's a huge hit for a business, and especially um, after the season that we've had. So I, what I'm saying is, m from my point of view, the rate has to go up. I'd like to get at least option three in the long run. Uh, and then um, it would be, for me, it would be a time schedule of how we get there. That that's my opinion. Well, I agree with you for the most part, Joanne. Uh, I think it, you know, I'd like to see if they just got done with a three-year program. And I would say let's do another three-year program and go option two in the first year, option three in the second year, and option four in the third year. That gives you $9 in option two, $10 at option three, and 15, it says 15, 33, just call it $15 at option four. Okay. So you said 9, 12, and 15. 9, basically. 10, and 15. 9, That's 10. the way those break out for the options that we have per square foot. Okay. Anything else before I go to Bruce? No. Bruce, <coughs> and understand we're setting a basis for discussion right. for the committee. Okay, or whatever. Say that again. What we're doing here is sort of setting a basis of a sort of our consensus. So when they have the discussion with Times Square, they know where we're coming okay. from. Okay. Uh, my understanding of what the merchants wanted to have a discussion about was not just. In fact, I didn't even think it was about the price. I thought it was about Times Square, the service levels. We'd like to see this change. We'd like to have something here. And um, and I and I and I agree with you. But that would be the third the third part of the discussion. One's the rental rate. One would be trash, and the third is this partnership concept. Yeah, but to me, the rate needs to reflect what the wishes are of the participants in Times Square. So if they say, you know, we don't mind paying X dollars, but we would really like to see you do this, this, and this. I've got no idea what it is that they want or what, what their concerns are. It may be they just want the chewing gum power washed off the bricks. I don't know. Or it may be something more significant. And so until you have that discussion and get their input as to what their wants and needs are, it seems premature to me to be setting the rate. And um, that's about all I've got to say. Yes, Dennis. Uh, you know, 
we can have the discussion. All we're doing now is setting a preliminary rate freeze. You know, after the discussion, and, and if nobody else wants to, I'll be happy to uh, to, to meet with the John and the merchants and be that in between if you guys will okay. go with that. Good. Is that good with you, Anita? It uh, doesn't matter to me. Okay, Dennis, you're it. So, you know, I have no problem with that. I'm, th I'm thinking right now we're just setting a preliminary rate, same as we're going to do with the garbage rate or what we're going to do with the garbage. Then I'll meet with them and bring that back, and then we can make any kind of adjustments we want. You know, they probably have some valid concerns. And if we say, okay, we're going to charge X, and they say, okay, well, you know, if we're going to pay that much, we'd like to see why, you know, and then between the two, we can come to what is a fair arrangement. I agree with you, Dennis. Without any parameters what it we'll whatsoever, have to start somewhere. you have to start somewhere. So I think it's good uh, to, to select thoughts. something at, for the beginning of the discussion. Anita? So I think you're, um, you're making a huge leap between the last discussion held by the town council, which agreed that the rates for the Times Square rentals would be governed by the Consumer Price Index. Um, granted, it was a three-year period, but that was the discussion. To go from that to what I'm going to call an absolutely random rental fee of, and, and take into consideration that I am in that square one of a couple of businesses that have no opportunity to lease the square footage. So the, to go from the CPI increase to the random increase of option two, which is um, C grape, has nothing to do with Times Square. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. To, to compare other, I'm guessing that these are interior, if you wanted to lease a space at, um, uh, at C grape Plaza or Santini Plaza or whatever, these are the, uh, rental rates per square foot. It just doesn't. Can I correct make that point, please? It, if they're not. No, this is, is this is the rate of the dirt. What does that mean? That means this is when we looked at the uh, LIPA information. We took out the building. You know, you have the you have the land, you have the building on your on your property assessment. Took out we took out the building part and we just looked at the land part, divided it by the square footage of the site. And that's what generated that rate. What's the Times Square number? Times Square number of, of 6,000 square foot? I have no idea where that, the, the well, baseline I mean, if, six came from, I have no idea where that, where that no, number came from. No, I mean, from. if you're going to give us a, if you're going to give us a $9 per square foot for Seagrate Plaza, you ought to tell us where the Times Square square foot would be. Uh, words, we'll be happy to get, we'll be happy to get you that number, just, but I suspect it's not six. But I'll be happy to get that. I'm sure it's not six, but neither here nor there. I I just think that you need to take into consideration where you are now, and not. I don't know what relevance there is of option one through five or option two through five. I have no idea. Just it's to me those are just numbers picked out of the air. Um, I will tell you that there's a. Um, this is a, will be a long, intense discussion, and um, and if I, if I were going to do something at this point, I would leave it exactly, I would maintain the consumer price index um, increases. And, and I, I um, understand what you're saying, but at the same point, this is uh, a prime, um, commercial real estate well, owned, you don't by, have to tell me that, owned, owned by the I, taxpayers and even to compare it frankly to sea grape um, I love sea grape I frequent it all the time by the way just FYI but um, I think that even to, to compare the uh, the outdoor space there the viability of it to Times Square is is giving people a break so um, I just I I wish we had five people here because um, we have a 2-2 two -two right now and that creates an issue um, because it looks like Dennis and I are thinking exactly the same well, way. Well, it doesn't really create an issue because we're going to, I mean, it's just a discussion. There's no, yeah, no okay. I mean. So, well, we have, we have, um, I guess we just, at the start of your discussion, Dennis, we have two or four council persons uh, for the record that would do a three-year plan like that. 
uh, as we well, discussed. We Bruce and and Bruce doesn't want to say anything. He wants right. to talk. Okay. And, and could I, could yeah. I just. And one for uh, CPI. And Bruce, what would you put on yours? I have a question. Option five, when, it's, when it says $60 a square foot, are you saying that's the land value? Kelsey? Kelsey O'Reilly, Public Works. Um, option five is each business's dirt. That's what? Divided by the square footage. So we went to the property appraiser. We found out what the price of the dirt was. And then we divided that to get a per square foot basis. So option five is the dirt value. Yes. Of, of all of these places. Of times square. square. Of each at individual one. So at Plaka's, we look at Plaka's. Uh, Pete's time out, we looked at Pete's time out. Okay. So, so option five is, is not a rent value. No, it's, it's a dirt value. It's the land value. So it's not an option. It's just an information column. Well, you know, I, 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 look, we're we're not. I, I want to be clear. We're not. We're not recommending option five. I don't, so I want to be very clear about that. But the fact of the matter is, is that if that additional area was theirs, ownership wise versus renting from the town wise, that price per square foot would be what they would be paying for that dirt. I would say at, at this point that 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 property in town in Times Square is going to be worth at least twenty dollars a square foot or better. With market rate. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating going from where we're at to $20 a square foot, obviously, even in the three years, but at the CPI, it'd take you 20 years to get anywhere near where the value of that property actually was. And I think also in this discussion that we need to consider uh, what Anita brought up, and I was going to bring up anyways, was there are, an, as an example, Anita's store. And when Roger and I and, and Chelsea went through Times Square, there was somebody out there with the display of sunglasses and stuff, and they're not allowed to have those displays out there. They can't rent part of that time, you know, that, that area. Where I think that they, any business in there, a legitimate business that has a storefront, should be able to rent the, the dirt in front of them. Whether it's because it's a restaurant, whether it's a dress shop, whether it's a sunglass shop, as long as they have a a, a bricks and mortar store there, like the restaurants that can rent it. If one can rent it, why can't the other one rent it? Don't disagree with you. I think that can be and, part and of the discussion. And I think it has to be. Ooh, it's a can of worms. Uh, could I just say that? And it, can I hear why that's a can of worms? Because I, I, beca and I'm asking you, even though I know you would recuse yourself on the final vote. Well, I'll, I'll speak very you've frankly been there, about You've it. been there for years, so you have a an opinion that's. Uh, think about the existing businesses in Times Square. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance. I mean no disrespect to any of my fellow business members. But think about the existing businesses in Times Square. And if John Richard were listening to this, he would remember a conversation. I, I constantly brought up a bookstore or a flower shop because I liked the idea of the, um, the image of a bookstore or a flower shop and the display that that type of store might present to the public. You could imagine that. And we talked about old San Carlos Times Square. But imagine the stores and the businesses that are there right now, what they would display to the public. And the reason that the retailers were prohibited from outdoor display of merchandise was because no one wanted to see all of that. It's like, you know, if you're going to sell less than uh, peeling t-shirts, uh, you're going to sell them inside your store. You're not going to put racks of them all outside. They didn't want everything to look like a flea market. I had the idea that it could look like something the like European the, Piazza, like Las <laughs> Ramblas in Barcelona. <laughs> it, could, it could look like that if you had those retailers. Or if you had parameters, we even talked one time about applying to be able to use that space where you would have to say, here's my design. This is, how, this is how I'm going to use the space. And I think there's value in that regardless of who's using that. So uh, to that end, I'd just like to say that in the broader conversation of Times Square, I think we ought to be looking at 
what does Times Square look like 20 years from now as we move into this next, next season of Fort Myers Beach's life? What does Times Square look like and what role does it play? How, how should we be saying, you know what? I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, John, but your umbrellas can't be yellow anymore because we're going to have a theme. Or I'm sorry, uh, Tom, you can't have that giant fan out there because it doesn't look good. And, and, and taking into consideration, I use those two people because I care about them a lot, <laughs> and I can say it. Um, but to talk about the public aesthetic you are leasing public space, and the public has a right to say how that space appears, how what it looks like. Now, we never in the past got to that um, kind of discussion because, uh, you know, and we probably won't this time either, because there was a lot of hoopla about you can't tell me what I can sell and what I can do. Well, when you're engaging with the public, yes, you can. About property, you can. And so, but I think that there's just, you know, the water main replacement, the, the maintenance, how are we going to deal with trash? I think that there is a new incarnation of Times Square that is far greater than how much we're going to charge for square footage of uh, the tables. Um, Anita? Yes. That was very well said. Oh, well, thank you, Joanne. <laughs> because <laughs> you, conjured, you conjured up... The next when, Times Square. When I'm sitting painting yes, Times exactly. Square, which I do, yeah. uh, I would, I delete You things. edit it. I edit, exactly right. I edit it for the aesthetic value. Sure. And, and so, and no. I think that's what we have a right for the, for the public to expect. So yeah. I retract saying that I'm in favor of expanding commercials summarily. I, I retract my statement from before, and I it think that's an important be. part of the conversation. It I, could I be. I it could it be. needs to be part of right. this conversation. Okay. But I think, so for the, for moving on, um, we sort of have a split, split decision here, but um, in this discussion with the group, you have a couple of us saying this, Bruce wants the big vision, she likes the CPI, uh, but it all. Oh, it, I think, I think the only, it, you know, we have an interesting group of people here, Roger and Chelsea, John being brought on for a historical and calm perspective. I think that we actually could have a conversation about what does Times Square do now? We know what Times Square's done for the last 20 years. What does the next 20 years of Times Square look like? So, and envisioning as well. So Madam we'll Vice call Mayor, this our, yes, sir. So just because I don't want the point to get lost and we have the media in the room, uh, I want to just remind you, to remind yourselves and your constituents out there that you, this council has budgeted money to begin to upgrade Times Square. Uh, the, the water line replacement is under design. You all have budgeted, if my memory is correctly, 30 some odd thousand dollars in this upcoming proposed budget for just cosmetic, because the, the, re, the, the permanent sort of redevelopment, redoing of Times Square is a couple of years off. So understanding that, you've budgeted money per, for, for to do, prove the aesthetics immediately in the upcoming fiscal year, and, and we, if that budget gets approved at the second hearing, that money will be there. We could sit down with the committee and John and talk about how it's best to apply that money and to do some of the things they're interested in seeing. So, um, as I said at the beginning, it, it's a very important town resource. Uh, that's a sort of a private-public partnership, and. W we all do well when it does well. So uh, I just don't want it to be said that, you know, the, the issues of Times Square are not being addressed by this council because they are. And uh, maybe it, it was too long in coming or not. I won't speak to that in, in any detail, but I will tell you that um, this council in two years, two budgets that I've been involved with have taken very proactive steps to begin to address the issues at, at Times Square. Thank you. So let's move on now to garbage because it's the trash uh, collection, uh, which is, uh, is the next one. Uh, Dennis, did you want to start? Who wants to start on this one? We're, once start. again, we just want to do just a little discussion so that John, Dennis have some sense of so, a starting so, point. So what was the conclusion of C? Uh, the conclusion is that, two, that uh, 
She thinks CPI is great. We we were looking at the you know that raise three year more. kind of raise, and that uh, I didn't get from you that you were ready to commit to anything particular. That's but. right, because I, I think if if these values are correct in terms of option five, the the values, then it should be a simple commercial rental lease price calculation based on that, and see what that comes out to. And I think if you use a cap rate, it pretty much comes back to what it is. But that may be wrong. So I would ask for a professional to, to give me a, a lease value rate and just understand what that is. Okay. Yeah, could I also clarify? I'm saying yes. CPI as things are. Mm -hmm. If we engage in Times Square for the new millennium, then it's a different conversation. Okay, good. And John's in the audience, so um, I'm, I'm assuming that that was good guidance uh, for a starting point for conversation. You get a sense of what we're thinking. And Chelsea, did you have something on this on this topic, or are you ready for the? So I just wanted to mention before we move to the, the second topic that yes. we have we have one sort of outlier issue that we need to we need to just mention in passing, and that one deals with uh, SOB because their situation is a little different. They have they have a physical improvements on top of the town's land. Um, and, and so, oh, I'm sorry. so with that, um, we, we, will, um, we will come back to the council with a specific recommendation, talking to that one individual about uh, how to address that situation because while they're in the vicinity, they sort of have a little unique situation. So we'll come back, and if we could reach an agreement with him, um, we'll just present that to council as a sort of a one-off type of thing. If we can't, we'll let you know what the point of, of uh, where we the, the, uh, go in different directions. Thank you. Right. Uh, anybody have a comment quickly on that one? No. No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. So, Chelsea, did you want to take this one and run with it? And if you'd like. Sure. So we've provided various options for the garbage collection services that we provide to the merchants in Times Square. It's a 365-day-a-year service, um, and that's we pick up totes, and we do that with our public works staff. Um, starting with your current, this is the current. Uh, you'll see the annual totes collected that we actually took a whole year's worth of um, information because we track how many totes are collected for billing purposes. So those are true numbers for an entire year. Right now, the recycle is shared, a flat rate shared amongst the merchants. Um, they purchase the bags, the green bags, uh, at cost. So there's no cost to the town for that. So you'll see the first numbers. If you'd like to discuss, or I can move on to the next. So there, there is an important distinction here versus the previous issue. Um, for the council to consider as you begin discussing the second issue. In the first issue, we're just trying to determine the value of this, this class, you know, when we can all argue about what that is. As it pertains to this issue, the waste pickup issue, it's different because right now, the amount that's being collected does not cover the cost of the service, which uh, government trend to translate that from government talk to plain talk means that the taxpayers are, are augmenting the cost of the trash being picked up in Times Square today. And as I said, we all have a stake in Times Square and all that earlier, so I, I won't uh, restate that, but it's important to understand that, that very important difference that in the first case, we're just saying, what do we think this is worth? Um, and you can set a value, and it, that just affects we, we make a little bit more money or we make a little bit less money. The second issue is we have money going, as a town, we have money going out the door in terms of taxpayers' money supplementing the cost of picking up the trash out there. So I just want to make sure you and, understand and, that nuance. And, and this isn't the trash that would be just in uh, town of Fort Myers Beach trash cans. You're talking about the trash for the specific 
commercial properties, not something that I'm walking to the pier and I have to drop something in at the town of Fort Myers Beach. Well, trash well, you know, to be to be perfectly honest, that yeah, we have trash cans out there, but that mean, but they also have trash cans out there for their businesses, and the average person walking by may use their trash can to some extent. I don't know to to w what extent, but um, if you were to ask me today. Um, you know, is it major or minor? I would say it's minor. Okay. By that point. Uh, Chelsea, was there anything else right off? Um, just, you'll see the various options. If you have questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, as of it, as it sits now, there is a $3,000 uh, maintenance fee incorporated in their bill, um, and that's split per person, uh, per, in, per entity. But $3,000 maintenance fee? There is. And it's based on the tiers. This system. Is this per month or? Yes. And and what do you mean by it's split by? You mean every business? I don't get it. Split. So yeah. it's somewhat of a intricate system how we charge. It's based on a tiered system. Um, the larger consumption businesses pay a percentage, whereas uh, there are three businesses that pay a flat fee. And the peddler's one of them. Uh, right, but I think. I think what's important is that that $3,000 a month fee is basically supposed to be the equivalent of what the staff cost is. And the staff cost for providing the service that we provide exceeds that. And you can see that in the other examples there. So, you know, you could talk about, we could talk about what the costs are, and then we could look at whether the tiering is right or wrong, whatever. And that's something we could do with the committee once we establish, okay, this is the amount of money we need to generate out there. We could talk about how they want to divide it sort of among themselves and get into that argument. But one of the, one of the things that perhaps a paramount issue for the council to, to deal with is the fact that right now it's being augmented to an extent and whether you're content with that or whether you'd like to bring that augmentation down over a period of time. Dennis, you're chomping yeah, at the bit. I, Go I, ahead. I think what we need to discuss first on this particular issue is whether we want to stay with the pickup the way it is, and I'm not talking about the cost, I'm just talking about stay with the pickup the way it is, or if we want to look at the compactor option. I walked around with, with uh, uh, Roger and Chelsea, and we looked like where could a compactor be put, so forth and so on, and I know Roger and Chelsea, I believe, met with advanced disposal to see Correct. what could be done there. So what is going to be more advantageous is it going to be the compactor or continue to do the way we're doing and then we'll discuss the pricing and stuff on that. So, you know, I think that's the first thing we need to determine. And um, with regard to the compactor, did with you regard, find a location, uh, a potential location? Well, I, I found, I, Roger and I both looked at a couple different mm -hmm. spots, but we, I don't know, I didn't get the uh, what advanced disposal thought as far as where they would locate one. And then secondarily, with advanced disposal, I don't know these things about compactors, and you're talking about something underground or above ground? No, it's above ground. Above ground. But instead of the individual totes, right? It's, it's, you just throw it in a compactor and it compacts it, and then advanced disposal comes in, picks up the compactor, empties it, and moves on. Okay, and that would be picked up daily or what? Because I can't Wouldn't imagine what it would not be daily. daily. Huh? Compactor would probably not be daily. Well, depends on the usage yeah, because the, right. the, the Santini Plaza has a compactor and it's picked up quite often. Yeah, yeah the, again, you're correct in the, in the fact that it would be based on the size of the compactor and the amount sure. of material generated, but I think that... Time of year. And time of time year. Of year um, stuff, you know, yeah. I, think, I think everyone would, would understand that from a cost perspective, if it doesn't have to be picked up daily, it would be cheaper. Absolutely. So I, you know... To me personally, I like the compactor idea better because I think it centralizes everything. We don't have people dragging garbage all over the place. They got one central place to put it in. They carry it over to the compactor. That eliminates the town out of that aspect of it and picking it up and hauling it someplace else to, to, to put it. All right, so you prefer the compactor, and if it weren't a compactor, what would you say about the rates? I'm just trying to give some basis for well, for the discussion the, here. You know, the rates give are, you know, Four opinions, at least on the record, for for the conversation. What do you think about 
Oh, uh, you know, we've tried the compactors in the past. Now, just because just because we tried it in the past doesn't mean it won't work now. Because be before they had to haul it to the compactor under the bridge, I believe. No, no there, there was, was there was there was a compactor at one. Yep, uh, and where was it located uh, in either side? It was located on Bill Whitaker's property, uh, where it is right there, um, where Pierside. Where Pierside's kind of side entrances, okay, right there. Have the big yes, because there's a where that's that's out. That was yes. one of the ones, the places yeah. I was thinking of. Yeah, and it it has a it has potential, and I think that could be part of a big picture discussion about how to redo Times Square to make it right. function better. I mean, this isn't the only place in the world that needs to kind of no. compartmentalize their stuff. But yeah, no, um, I, gr I agree with you, but I think that we just need work. to. To, to determine for discussions with the with the merchants later, what the town council is looking at, and then we can always, you know, review our, our what we're looking at and make changes or whatever. But I think just for purposes of a discussion with them, do we want to go compactor wise or do we want to go the other way? And then if we determine which one, then we can look at the price of that one. Um, and then, um, do you think that um, if we didn't do a compactor? Rates would need to go up anyway, though. Well, there's no question. I okay. mean, I w you know, I, I think that as a town, we need to at least cover the what it costs us. All right, we've got one opinion on the record. How about you, Bruce? Well, it makes sense that we recover our cost. I'm, I am having a hard time understanding what the costs are when I look at these sheets. Of that is because each each business pays probably a little different cost depending on their usage. Oh, when is I look, that correct, Roger, each one pays yes. a little different. Yes, depending on their usage. Yeah, but you have some fixed cost there, I'm sure. Other than the fact, that, you know, the variable is going to be the usage. Um, so did you want? Yeah, yeah he wants to ask Chelsea. Yeah. So when you look at this, it says current rate incorporating full labor costs, annual labor collection, column B, the, the second exhibit yes. at the bottom of the page. That's six, seven, 67000 When I go to the next page, it says annual labor cost collection is 80000 What am I missing there? So essentially all of the... Okay, all of the garbage that is collected in Times Square is t brought back here to Town Hall and put into our dumpster. So we don't have, we, we get one bill from advanced disposal for the disposal of that garbage. They know what a 96 gallon tote disposal fee is, and that's this by tote franchise rate. So it is $5.62 to dispose of the garbage in, a, in one 96 gallon tote. Five dollars and what? Sixty-five cents. Sixty-two. Sixty-two cents per bag. Per tote. Per per. Or ninety-six per gallon tote. Gallon for ninety-six tote. gallon tote. The green bags we have. No, no, no. Oh, the whole tote. tote. Oh, the tote. Tote. oh, oh, got it. Okay. However many bags you can put in a tote to material, it's just the tote itself is five sixty-two cents. What's that got to do with column B? I'm confused again. So, the full labor cost is the true disposal rate of their totes whereas this one is still bringing it back here and in the town putting it in our dumpster all right let, let's start all over again by tote franchise rates plus full labor costs what, yes. are you seeing that's somebody else doing it not that's the town? The, the town doing it we know one tote cost 562 and if we pick up five totes from a store it car it costs advanced disposal five dollars and 62 cents Per tote to, dis to dispose of that trash. So th there's 8,000 totes times five, that's 40,000 round numbers. What's that got to do with column B? You keep, I, I, I see, see column B 80 labor on it. Don't forget, we have to carry the totes sometimes. We bring the totes out from behind the buildings and bring them out, put them in a truck, bring them back to town hall here, and throw them in our dumpsters. Then take the totes back to Times Square and put them back behind the buildings. Correct. That's where your labor cost comes in. So what's the difference? Column B, 80,000, 
in column B on the other exhibit, 67,000. They both say that they're full labor costs. One second, please. One is based on the 3,000 flat, 3,000 a month, it looks like. A, no, that's A, B includes two staff positions. Yeah, they can, you would think they'd be the same. And while Chelsea's calculating, uh, I, I, there has got to be a better way to analyze this and um, break this down to, so that the council can make a policy decision that we want there to be greater um, merchant participation, less public participation, but the how that happens is certainly not a policy decision. It's, it's a logistics issue of garbage collection. And there are some weird anomalies here that are just left over from back in the day. I mean, look, look in the first in the current here. Look at Sandal. That's the Sandal factory. That's the old West Coast surf shop. They're still paying a flat rate. Look at them compared to local color. I can guarantee you that boxes of shoes reuse a heck, there's a lot more trash generated by that store than there is by mine. But look at the difference. I mean, I'm paying, uh, you know, two and a half times what they're paying. Actually, you're this, paying like, uh, if you look at uh, just sort of doing and against H2 actual costs, if you look at that, what, she, the, what the chart mm -hmm. showed actual cost yep. to be, the range is quite remarkable. It is. Like Tiki's paying 17%. Of the actual, pretending that the actual cost, it's its a constant at least to compare these against. Tiki's paying 17% and uh, actually uh, um, several are in the 45 to 47%. One's at 17%. Uh, H2O's only at 20%. Look uh, at Mango Rita's. Mango Rita's is a restaurant. Sandals Their at number should be way right. up. So in other words, it's, it's not equitable right now. It's How do not you feel accurate. about, you clearly know, you're not sure about uh, what that cost recovery is. Uh, but so I think Chelsea agree, can explain that difference. He, he agrees that it's a cost recovery issue yes. though. I yes. think that that's important because I think that's, I'm not sure that we're ready to get into the dollars and cents so in such detail. I think what we want to do is have direction for this meeting. Now, do you prefer the compactor? Are you in favor of the compactor discussion? So let me just okay, let me sorry. just mention this about the compactor discussion because I don't want this to sort of get lost in in the other the other very valid points the council is debating. The compactor to buy, to buy the compactor is thirty eight thousand five hundred dollars and put and physically put it in place. So you have that cost on top 38, of thirty eight thirty eight five. Yes, okay. on top of the daily service. So I just mm -hmm. want you to, to everyone to understand it. So, you know, we're in these alternatives, we're talking about the cost of daily service. Okay. The compactor is, you know, physical entity, a physical thing that has to be bought, installed, and hooked up. So that's that cost. So um, just to be clear, when you're talking about the compactor, um, you, you are talking about perhaps the, one of the more expensive options just because you have the outlay of the compactor on top of the day-to-day -day service, whether it's daily or every other day or every third day or whatever it winds up being. On um, compactor? No, I mean, just what does this A cost versus B would be what my Yeah, one she, I think Tracy, uh, Ch Chelsea's going to take another attempt to explain those two different When numbers. I say A versus B, I mean compactor versus totes, or that's what I meant. Okay, go ahead. In regards to the B, that you had asked before, that $80,000 is split evenly amongst all of the merchants, whereas on the current rate incorporating full labor cost is based on the per tote pickup. So it's still that percentaged and that tiered system. So my question is a simple one. How much is it? It shouldn't matter how you divide it. It's the annual total should be the same either way. Right? I mean, if it's the same formula to get to the grand total, the grand totals ought to match. And we're talking $13,000 here. I mean, it's 
this or that, but it's I'm just trying to understand what the cost of this. Right. So, so the important so the important takeaway, uh, Council Butcher, is that currently it's thirty. We're 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 for staff time. We're getting thirty six, and if you take the low number of the two, it, it should it be uh, where it doesn't cost us anything. Would be at least sixty seven five. And so, um, uh, Bruce, basically, you agree that we need to review as far as recovering costs and that the discussion of the compactor is obviously uh, part of the discussion of how we do this. And um, just for the record, I feel the same way. In 2015, um, the t that town council at that time was uh, Mr. Andre, Mr. Mandel, et cetera, that group. And they say the trash rates should have been at least 50-50 at that point and then revisit and, and do this. So um, nobody's paying even 50% right now. And I concur, number one, the rates have to go up. We have to recover. The taxpayers shouldn't be doing this. And I think there's a big conversation to be had. I agree if we can do it with a compactor in the vision of moving forward for Times Square, that may be the best vision. You know, within the vision, that may be best. Um, and a better use of staff time who can be doing other things for the, the taxpayers would be terrific. Um, and then the other thing is, I think this really begs to say, oh my gosh, look how much trash we're generating. Uh, that needs to be part of the discussion. Absolutely. Because um, on an individual basis in terms of protecting the environment, each of us, has to think about how we generate less trash. So that will save money if part of the discussion can be how do businesses not generate so much trash. Uh, <laughs> and then um, We stop secondly, doing business with China, number one, because you ought to see a box of stuff that comes from China. Yeah. Dear Lord, if, I mean, they must have, it's, it's unbelievably how things are packaged. So much packaging. I'd say and, half and, the box is packaging. And we can't recycle anymore. China won't take it all of the, our countries, that's a whole other topic. We have a problem. So part of the discussion should be Online. reducing the volume of trash to reduce costs, and then the costs are going to be going up. The taxpayers are not going to be subsidizing it to the extent they currently are, and what that will be will be part of the discussion. So I think that we have the guidance we need for the discussion, just I, as far as some be, talking points. I would just be remiss if I did not put on the record that when the town took over the CRA from the county and went and put the CRA into place in Times Square, there were agreements made that trash, that these things would be taken care of because we eliminated that business's ability to have regular trash pickup. And so I think that it'd be interesting to have as part of this conversation, for example, what, what did Pete's Time Out pay f on an annual basis for garbage pickup in 1995. What was that garbage rate? Because that's that's what they did pay. And how has that how has that increased? We could look at other businesses to see how it's increased. And you would come up with a number of if the town had not built Times Square this is how much that business would be paying for but, trash. And, but we have that number because that number is what advanced disposable, uh, disposal currently charges, which is $5.65 per tote. So my point is... Um, I don't think that's accurate. Well, at any rate, it's yeah. a lot more than what, the, it's a I, lot just, more than what they're paying. Interesting, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's John? true. However, how much did the business's business increase by building Times Square and eliminating and not, the cars. Not, listen, so. I, I say that to my buddies all the time, but they are quick to remind me that the town made the decision to do this, and yes. So. Um, do you think, uh, as our representative, Bruce, do you think you, that you have enough feedback from the council? Right I'm sorry, Dennis, why am I doing that today? <laughs> I forgot to put my name on yeah, my shirt put, again. Where Damn are your names at? <laughs> sorry, Dennis. Um, do you think you, you have enough information to go yeah. forward? And I think we have a little direction. So yeah, I believe was there so. anything else you wanted John to finish with, Chelsea or, or Roger, as a parting thought? No, just um, I guess um, we'll work with uh, John to try to do something, um, you know, sooner than rather than later yes. because we do have, right. you know, our annual rate schedule being going to be contemplated by the council soon, et cetera. So we just need to try to get a handle on some of these things. 
That's Sounds great. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next time when we see this, I, I would prefer just to see the bottom line totals, what the annual costs, how many totes, how many bags, whatever, and not try to show it by entity. Just understand what the basis for all the numbers in an aggregate way, and then we have to have some discussion about how to divide it up, I guess, right? Counselor, I'll, t I'll, t I'll tell you that um, I don't know the, the thought process behind the initial tiering thing, um, but I would have liked to be at that party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beware of what you wish for, Roger. <laughs> okay, is everyone ready to move on to item E then, which is uh, stormwater ordinance? And um, that's getting pulled for further discussion, is it not? Yes. Um, on Monday's meeting, um, the town council um, voted or decided um, that we're going to do uh, this as a single MP. Our request at that meeting was actually that we receive all the information, specifically the original. What we asked for originally was the original ordinance, which was about 1508. Um, the resolution that was passed by the town council subsequent to that with regard to an exemption for um, uh, Bay Beach. And then um, the working the workings of the uh, committee and what their final committee was. Um, so, and then we wanted to go to M&P with that. Now, um, when I looked at this, I'd like to clarify something before we set an M&P date, though, because it was a little difficult for me. It took a while for me to figure out what was what here in this. Um, the way the packet came out to us, Ordinance 1508 is in here. And then um, I did not see, did I miss where the resolution was in here? Was the res That's not in there all. Okay, if you can get that to us. And then the next two things, and I actually sent a, a text to Mr. Peterson about that. The next ones, it says working 12-15-18, and then draft 4-13-18. And which, Bruce, you were on the committee, uh, when I studied this and looked at different notes, it appeared to me that the one that says draft 4-13-18 is the final committee one. Is that correct? tell you that with any certainty and so and that's what we want um, I, I this says working and the other one says draft and what we asked for is what was the final committee one that came from committee so if that we can is number six where is number what, what's number six the sorry last draft dated June 2018 is the final the last uh, entry in the book which is called the last draft dated June 18. That is the final draft that came out of committee, and that's the one that is being proposed. Uh, wait, wait. That's, is, is that, the, uh, is that, that before we went be. and talked to the town staff or after the town staff? This is after the town staff. Okay, no, that's not what they're looking before. for. That's not what they're looking for. They're, they right. want the one before we had the, the meeting with the town staff. And I believe that's the one marked draft 413.18. I'm not wait. sure that it is. Okay, so um, what we're looking for for the M&P, and mm -hmm. if you could send it out as soon as possible, it's what we had asked for a couple meetings ago um, when we set an M&P was very specifically 1508, then the resolution um, that followed, then the exact one that came from the working of the committee, and then if you would like to add at the end one that came from committee with staff changes, as long as each one is clearly marked and delineated exactly wh which is which. Is that correct from ca yes. what council direction was? Yes. Bru uh, Dennis, is that what you thought council direction was? I really don't care. Okay. And Anita? Was. Okay. I, that no, was I what council direction. So for that M&P, could we have that? clearly defined, and then um, are we going to pick a date now? Madam Vice Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, just to kind of follow along, at least my understanding of council protocol, when we when we have MPs, that's really for discussion and issues among the council. Right. You know, if, if you're going to have a, um, a joint meeting with the um, ad hoc committee on stormwater, that's fine, and maybe we should call it that so we don't 
get into this practice of getting Good idea. Excellent. No public comment at Excellent MMPs. point. The same with so the Times Square people. Same with the Times Square. So, um, Roger or uh, Mr. Peterson, what shall we call this meeting and when shall we, how much time shall we allot and what will our date be? I think you need at least uh, two hours and call it a workshop. Because I know that uh, Mr. Eck and the other members uh, have uh, very strong opinions and I'm sure they'll bring them forward. <laughs> So it's going to be a workshop with the ad, ad hoc committee. Um, so we won't do it on a necessarily uh, MMP date. It looked like um, all the members of the ad hoc committee to make sure that they're all back in town. It looked like it needed to be after October 27th. Are we going to have our new attorney look at this? Um, that's another topic for discussion. But no. uh, I, I think before we go any further, the, the, the new attorney should look at look this over as well. And I think you should also t uh, research what happened with the uh, uh, same type of an issue down in Key West, which includes everybody. Because I didn't even bother looking at this stormwater ordinance because with Mr. Rack on the committee, I can guarantee you that there's still 100% credits in there. And I'm not going to participate in anything that gives 100% credits. I'm not going to put the, the, the cost of this stormwater project on the back of the rest of the taxpayers because they feel that they shouldn't get charged anything. They need to pay their fair share with as long as, as well as everybody else. And if there are 100% credits still in this thing, I won't even be at the meeting because I'm not going to discuss it. I will not vote for it and I'm not going to discuss it. So, um, uh, with regard to the new attorney, shall I go there right now, Roger? Or? Well, so I think, I think that um, to save to save whoever works on this prospectively from the legal standpoint uh, some heartache. I think it, there, there is some value in hearing from the working subcommittee, ad hoc committee directly by council to hear their perspective. And once you've done that, you can then decide, well, we agree with everything we have to say. It doesn't, doesn't require further review or thank you for your input. We, we do want further legal review or not. Um, so I think you have to, um, you know, to take where we are and, and kind of work, go forward in, in some fashion. Um, at the end of the day, the, whatever product comes out of that workshop, whether it's 100% the ad hoc committee version, 100% the, the staff version, or some hybrid version, or maybe there's a decision to, to throw the baby in the bathwater out and start all over, whatever that is, that'll be your direction to the attorney at the time. Right. That sounds good. Um, do we want to um, uh, select a date? Because th that, you know, we can add anything to the end of the package. We know what town council directed that they wanted in the packet. If something more is on the end and it's identified exactly what it is, that's okay too. But as long as we get the minimum of what we requested so that we can have this uh, soiree. Um, we got in this sort of discussion about the date at the last meeting, it doesn't matter to me so long as all I think all five of us need to be present. That's the only thing I can say. Well, and Dennis so is saying he's not going to come well, regardless, so that puts him out. All five need to be available to come if someone Madam chooses. Madam Vice Mayor? Yes. Can we just consider the um, afternoon of the November M&P? You guys are here that, that morning anyway, and... Um, you know, we'll, we'll stop it. If, if we have to stop the MMP road, we'll stop it, whatever, at 1 o'clock, pick up and have this meeting with them. Is that something that makes sense? And that would be uh, Thursday, November 8th. Um, I think that that's fine. We can set a date certain, and you're right. If we have to interrupt our MMP, switch over to that. Where So we have a time certain of, shall we say, 1 o'clock? Let's just, let's just make sure that the, the management and planning meeting of November 8th is very short and concise. Let's limit it till noon, and then or or ten or eleven o'clock. Just make it a short. Management We're going to break for lunch for sure at noon. So and just how that works. Lunch. Just to be clear, yeah. how that works is we put the stuff on the agenda. You guys can truncate the meeting at any point <laughs> you'd like to. <laughs> we have more. Are you saying we have some control over this? You Roger? absolutely do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so are we going to say one o'clock um, Thursday, November eighth? 
Does that work? For, is everyone available? Whether they choose to stay or come it's or not. It's on my, on my are schedule. Are you available? For, well, if that's a regular MNP, I'm available. Very good. All right. And, um, and I'm excused from that Monday town council meeting, but I will make myself back by Thursday. So, all right, we have our time. Is Second that for you, enough Michelle? direction? Workshop on November 8th at 1 o'clock? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move to item F. And um, this one is Ordinance 1509. This is street performers. Roger, did you want to introduce this or Mr. Peterson? Who's well, I, I was just going to say, say that. Um, or Sarah. <laughs> we, we took a cursory look at it, and the, the, and the staff was saying to me, well, what about this section? What about that section? And, I, and, I, and I, I got to the point where I said, well, look, I think it's just better to put something in front of the council and have them tell us, like, we don't like you know, section, we want you to revisit section, you know, 10192A or whatever it is. So, or, you know, so we, because right now I feel like we think we know what some of you are concerned about, but we're not really certain we understand what some of you, your concerns may be. So we just thought it'd be better put the document in front of you so you can go through it and say, you know, we want more permits, we want less permits, we want the, the performances, uh, better defined, we want to limit the number of people out there on any one given day, and, and any other issue you think might be salient and for us to then go back and redraft and try to address that concern. Thank you. And Anita, I think this was something that you brought forward. It so is. how about if you start, please? Um, uh, the whole concept, um, it's, it's, been, it's been quite a few years since we had what I would call real street performers in Times Square. But at the time that we did have them, uh, was part of our Main Street program, and uh, it was really quite successful. And we had, we had some street performers that were on par with the type of street performer you'd see in Key West. Uh, uh, unfortunately, since then, uh, that's dropped off, and now what we have are what I would call mobile vendors. Um, I, I believe that street performers need to be, and I was I told Jason this. A performer is a performer. A performer is not a vendor. Uh, they need to be identified. They need to have some sort of tag or button or something that identifies them as a permitted street performer from the town of Fort Myers Beach. And they should not just simply be able to set up shop in the middle of the square. Uh, it's, um, it again creates that, uh, flea market type environment and as much as some people may like uh, the guy who paints surfboards or whatever, uh, that's not a street performer. A uh, street performer is a musician or a, um, a juggler or a uh, uh, magic guy, whatever. Um, but it isn't, it isn't what we have had in recent times. And um, I think that uh, it's been rather distasteful, let me just say that. Um, there is one sp to be specific about um, the, the ordinance that we have here, uh, item zero, uh, or letter O. Page, in, page? Uh, page 72 of the packet. Thank you. Uh, it says no street performer may sell or offer for sale t-shirts, toys, compact discs, or any other goods or services. There needs to be some clause to this because, for example, if you have a musician and the musician, one time we had a guy who played a steel drum, he was fantastic, and he also had his CDs there for sale. I, I would be okay with that. He is doing a performance and he has something for sale. There's always the gray area of the gentleman who weaves the palm frond hats. He's, <laughs> it was a constant um, hassle. Is he or is he not a performer? You know, he's not just weaving those hats to weave them, he's weaving them to sell them. So, uh, you know, these are the kind of little nuances that you have to decide when you, um, when you determine this, and it's very difficult. Uh, but I think there should be some, some way that either staff or council has an ability to say, 
okay, yep, you're a street performer. We want you in the square. Again, it goes to that whole aesthetic of what are we allowing to be in the public space? I will tell you that when I brought this, I think it was to Chelsea or maybe it was Roger Molly, I don't remember who it was. There was a gentleman who was kind of set up in front of Mango Rita's and he had a little old fashioned TV tray that he put a towel over and I don't know what he was selling, but it was not, it, it gave a very bad view. Um, so uh, it just needs to be reined in. They either need to be a real performer or they need not to be in the square because if they're simply a vendor, they need to do what the rest of us do and have a store. Because what, what, we, what, we, go ahead. What about a snake charmer? What, what would you call him? I would call a snake charmer, a belly dancer, a, I would call all of them. Uh, I don't think we allow snakes though. We don't allow animals. No, but animals. no animals, animals in your acts. No animals in the acts. It, I, I'm just saying what's on here yeah, now. I'm not, fine. I'm yeah. I was looking at the no animals because in Key West they got the cat guy. Well, I wish we had the cat guy, but uh, yes, I mean, no I'll tell you, guy. I'll tell you, we had one gentleman who actually um, petitioned the town council. Um, he was a sword, flaming sword person. His act was very impressive, but uh, I can't remember if we allowed him to perform or not allowed it, allowed him to perform because it looked very dangerous. So, uh, you know, my whole reason in bringing this up is um, it, it has to be cleaned up. It, it, they have to be a performer. They cannot be a vendor. Is, it, uh, is there some sort of a uh, diagram of Times Square where we set aside where these people can be? No, well, that's one of the things that staff turned around, turned around. Uh, discussed internally, and that is whether we should have designated spots within Times Square. I, I would think so, because so otherwise that they just plop their butt down wherever they want. Well, they you know, to make sure that, um, you know, there's throughput and they're not blocking existing businesses and other things. I think we should have, in my opinion, we should have designated areas for them. Doesn't make any difference which one's in which area. They can move them around or whatever, but this area here, 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 and here. You have a diagram with them. Say these are the designated areas, and that's it. If you're not in one of those, you're getting bounced. So what's what's our problem with our current process? The, a lot of what is in here reflects what you're talking about, I think Anita. It, I think oh, it I, has. I'll, I'm sorry. I thought that was me. It was. But I'll 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 step back and let. Oh, uh, were you asking Roger? Or are you asking me? Well, I was asking generically, I guess. So. Well, whoever, let's start with Roger, and then, or, uh, let's okay. start with Roger. Okay. And well, Anita. well, one of, one of the one of the problems that y we sort of have with any of these programs is people come in and they fill out a form. They say, I, you know, I do X, and it's it, and in eight words they're summarizing what they do, and then they get a permit, and then they're out there operating. And their interpretation of that eight words gives them the latitude to pretty much do a whole bunch of other stuff. So I think that's one issue. Um, Frankly, you know, um, just just my cursory reading through the thing is is for, for a program of this magnitude, we have a lot of words on a lot of pages, and we really don't have a narrow focus on really exactly what we're trying to accomplish or not accomplish here. So I think I think there's value to a rewrite, and it, there's, there's definitely value to a um, to things like. Let's, let's have de a, lim a certain number of designated spots, and that may or may not translate directly to the number of street performer licenses we give out. Let's understand, you know, what we want in, in terms of um, street performers. I don't know. Maybe the council would even go as far as to say, look, we want these people to audition in front of Crab or something and say, okay, that's we want that act on Times Square, no, we don't like that act on Times Square and give give the staff and, and council a recommendation. So, you know, we leave it to you. Um, you know, one thing maybe the thing to do is say, hey, let's just, let's just put a, you know, 90 day moratorium in this and see if anyone misses them and, the, the, you know, whether we should even be having a street performer program, period. You know, I mean, oh. you can go from that end of the spectrum 
all the way to today that what we're doing today is fine. So I I, and anywhere in between. I would, I Anita, would did you want to respond? Oh, I would definitely agree with putting a moratorium until we decide. Um, because you've just got these, you know, sort of rogue people. But um, I like the idea of, um, unless it's very clear of maybe interviewing with CRAB or saying, hey, you know, here's what my act is. I'd like to do this. You know, a, a real street performer, real street performers make great livings, but they don't make a good living when they are in the same area as what I'm going to call mobile vendors, to be polite. Um, they don't, they, they, those two breeds don't mix. Real street performers are, tend to be gypsies, but they, they, they lock into a zone. And like I said, for quite a few years, we had a great group of people and, um, and they were very entertaining. But, but they've gone because we just sort of, I don't know, I, I, I think I, I this somehow, is worthy somehow of a Somehow I'm envision, envisioning America's got, America's got talent out here, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I'm trying to figure if I'm uh, J I don't think you'll or have am I Gwen Stefani? Who am I up here? You won't, no, you won't, have, that, you won't have that many I'm people. Teasing. I, right now, Fort Myers Beach isn't the location that they pick. Right. It's, it's just they, they move around, and Fort Myers Beach is just not a location because for the street performers, every single one of them, they wanted to be right in front of the clock. And we tried to move them down to um, Snug Harbor. We tried to move them to the other side of the square, like in front of local color. No, everybody wanted to be right there. And, you know, it, it's, it's difficult. I, w I, would, I, would, I would probably say let's just stop this for a while and um, not allow anybody to do business other than registered legal businesses in Times Square. Uh, until we readdress this. Um, well, how do you feel about a moratorium on it for now? Since that's a, a topic right now. That's well, <clears throat> unfortunately, I don't have a good sense for who's down there now or how many's doing it. Do the merchants want it? Do they don't want it? Well, there's one merchant that doesn't <laughs> want it right now that wants a mor moratorium. Um, I, I, I don't care either way. I don't uh, I, I have to uh, acquiesce to Anita. She's the one that's down there. She's the I one like the fact of you there. acquiescing to me. Dennis, Look at that. Just by okay. <laughs> well, FYI. Um, can, can I mention one thing, by the way, just on the topic of, of this? If you'll notice on um, page uh, 69, um, it says um, section uh, 10, 192, third of the way down, number A, page 69. Uh, 10 192 a um, you'll notice the number of permits will be determined during the annual budget process and may be adjusted as deemed necessary so we can say the number for right now is zero just to let you know I wanted to point that out if we're talking about a moratorium or we're talking about not issuing no, I them just say we should we, I think we should have zero right now and and if you if you all would like I will be happy to work with Roger and Chelsea or whomever on this yeah. and um, and come up with a um, a part two street performer and then Roger you look like you wanted to jump in sorry right and so I just uh, wanted to remind the council that we we will be speaking to the merchant group on two other matters, and you know, if the, the council list. would like, we can add this as a third would item for the agenda to sure. see what. So very, I think that'd back, be very important. Bring, uh, the councilor could bring you back. They want it, they want it to right. restart tomorrow. Or they they, or they don't care if it ever You're restarts or somewhere in between. And 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 I, I think that's good because Anita, we do. Um, uh, we look to you for feedback on this because you're there most yep. present, but at the same point we recognize it's the five of us that have a responsibility Absolutely. to make this decision, and we want to take that off of your shoulder where you're the one uh, doing it. I wanted to say, did you have something else? I'm sorry. I do. Okay. Bruce, you weren't done. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, well, I, I was done, but then I thought of something else. Okay. And then we'll okay, back. so permits. People that have permits today, do they end at the end of September? That's my understanding, sir. Okay. On page 70, it says they end on September 30th of this okay. year. Okay. So a guy that's got a permit, we put a moratorium in, he's getting chipped out of two weeks. So 
Well, no, I th I would let them go until they, I would I would yeah, let them at September thirty if they're done. Okay. Yeah. What I would do though, when when you're doing Anything this rewrite, else? a suggestion would be if you're going to make designated spots, however many spots you designate is how many permits you give out. Well, the thing is, though, Dennis, is that if I'm I'm not going to talk about existing people. I'm going to talk about when we really had street performers. They're seasonal. The street performers usually aren't here in September. Uh, they're seasonal by nature and. They rotate in and out. I mean, the one in in the past, we've had some that, that they all work together and they they do that themselves. They police themselves. When it works well, it works well. When it's like it is now, it's it doesn't. Well, I'm just suggesting if we only have say ten spots out yeah, there, yeah, we don't need to have ten, twenty street performer and then permits. Then you don't need to have twenty per permits. Yeah. That's all I'm saying is try to kind of. Somehow, yeah. you know, maybe give an extra couple out so that when somebody don't show up, somebody else can get in there. And as far as the permit thing, I would I would make issue them a, a a town issued permit that they have to have with them all the time when they're down there. And and once and again, all you got to do is walk up and say, "Let me see your permit." Um, if they can't show it to you, uh, once again, uh, we have that in here. Uh, they are supposed to uh, have the permit on them on their body. Um, and, uh, it's in it's in here. I thought it was is on. There. I'm sorry. Display. It of, is there? Th there's a display of permit clause in this already. So, we we support we do support that. And then um, my only comment would be then that um, I, I looked up the definition of performance art, and of course they say it's acting, poetry, music, dance, and they say painting. But we what we need to do is have a de definition for us of what. Performance art at Times Square, what what category? I think it might help to have a definition. Other than that, I have uh, nothing else to um, nothing else to add. Is this enough direction to get started? And when, how, and when would we bring this back? So I think um, <clears throat> if the council is um, agreeable that we not issue any permits for October first. Well, we can make some progress on it and try to uh, probably wouldn't schedule for the November MMP, but possibly the December one to give you an update of where we're at and see if there's something you all would like, you're comfortable with to start up potentially on January 1st. Very good. Is that the consensus that we do that yes. for um, September 30th? I, my, my only comment about that is that if in season there's a need or a desire to have street performers by not having it done to December or this does that mean you know a guy calls and wants to get a permit and he says well this we haven't decided yet well, that seems kind of late for season activities I guess my only point well and my, I guess my reaction to that would be um, we really need time to hear back from the merchants um, and um, it may be that to go without the performers for a season and see what that's like is not necessarily a bad thing either. I'm not. I'm not What's sure. What's happened? The sunset celebrations have taken over the street performers role mm -hmm. because they're there on the weekends. They're in the prime situation. There's no place for a street performer. That's uh, what that that in essence is what has happened. So you're not concerned about getting to the end of December or into January and not having to make decisions. I decision. am not concerned about it at all. Okay. Dennis, I think it are will you help concerned? Oh, no. Okay, I'm not concerned. So three of us. Okay. Any anything else before we move on? So uh, once again, Roger, you're thinking when would we see this again? <clears throat> um, I'm hoping that the um, the meetings with the committee and and staff analysis and individual feedback from you all and uh, all that can result in a rewrite that we could have in front of you for the December MMP. And then my only final question would be then, this says during the budget process that the town council can determine that. Should we actually at our budget meeting have a formal official um, something of us saying that we're doing enacting 10-192A just so that all five of us are here, we could say that? I or don't think we need to. It I'm just saying legally, budget, what budget do we have process, to do? The budget, we're in the budget process right now. I think just... This, I, I just want to make sure that this this consensus is good. Yeah, to to I guess be um, 
um, adhere to the letter of the law, we could just have a motion at the 24th saying okay. that. In the consent gonna, agenda, maybe? Uh, no, I wouldn't even put it on the agenda, just in your budget okay. discussion. I would Very just good. have that as, as a, a, a motion in that within that okay. conversation. So you'll make sure that that's in there then? I'll remind you to make that motion or one of the other oh, councils. Oh, we have to do it. All right. Let note. me. Uh, good luck on that. Okay. Okay. I got to write it down. That's how I do things. Madam Clark will make a note of it also. Okay. Okay, got it. All right, sorry. So we are now up to um, the magistrates. Number G. Item G. Letter G. Madam Not Vice Mayor. So. I was um, told today that besides the uh, application in your packet, um, you should have a second application that was distributed. Does council have that? Jack. From Jack. Was it, was it upstairs this morning or yeah, something? Yeah, it was. Uh, here, do you want to see it? Okay. And um, to to further um, complicate your deliberations is I was, uh, I had a conversation with the uh, town attorney designee uh, this morning and he indicated that he was considering withdrawing as a candidate for town attorney oh. and would <laughs> like to pursue the position of um, special magistrate, and he, but he has not um, sent that to me in writing yet. So that was Mr. Thomas. Yes, ma'am. He wants to be the town attorney and a special no. magistrate. No. no, he doesn't want to be oh. the town attorney. He wants to be the special magistrate. No, he he was honored to be selected as town attorney, yes. uh, but after Monday's meeting, yes. um, he felt uncomfortable that he did not have full support oh, of a town council sakes. that he would of a town council that he would work for that he would not does not feel it's in the benefit of the town to not have a very solid working relationship with the town council who employs him and that is his concern that he does not have the support that would indicate the kind of relationship that we ought to have with our town attorney. Um, that is what he personally expressed to, to, to me. And that the only reason he, would, he was putting his name in as a thought for a magistrate was that you could begin a relationship with him, see what he brings to the table, and should you need to change attorneys moving forward, that you would then have familiarity with him such that you would be thrilled and honored on a 5-0 basis to have him as the town attorney. That was, that was the issue. That was the issue. So. Um, I'm very hesitant to say anything on this, so I'm not going to say anything. Well, uh, me, me too. But I think what, we, what it comes to is this. There should, have been, there should have been absolutely no doubt in his mind that we all, all of us, felt he is a competent attorney. We all liked him tremendously. Um, attorneys, attorneys work for three votes. They don't work for five votes. Town managers work for three votes. They don't work for five votes. In a world, in a perfect world, of course you want that. There, I was never, in my comments, I certainly, and I believe I said it a couple of times, in no way, shape, or form do I wish to demean him in any way. And I am a firm believer that once the council takes an action, that is the action of the council, and he would never have a problem with me, ever, ever. That's, that's it. I, the action's taken. He's our attorney. That's, I find this. I find this a bit shocking. Um, well, I guess we'll see what he does. 
but that, that leaves us in a precarious situation, makes me very uncomfortable. Um, it does leave us in a, and I, I'm going to just look at this in terms of what's transpired. If Mr. Thamis were our attorney, and we're making a transition with Peterson Law Group, um, I know that Mr. Peterson has applied, but we need a magistrate immediately, and I see a conflict with, I'm gonna talk about each candidate. I see a conflict with um, somebody who's still our attorney for 60 days at least, um, also being our magistrate, and someone who has been prosecuting current code cases being on the magistrate side now for the people that have ongoing code, code cases. So, and then, then, then there's the Mr. Thanos. And so since we haven't really gotten to know who our next attorneys will be now, what our transition might be with Peterson Law, or if there is no transition or whatever, it would appear to me if we need a code enforcement officer right now that we should go with, with um, uh, is it Roche, Ms. Ms. Roche? Um, Ms. Roche, because we can continue the magistrate, magistrate proceedings, and I'm not saying I don't know that this needs to be a year thing, if she would be willing to do it for a period of time, but in any case, we need a magistrate while we're figuring out what we're doing with our legal services. What, what, what is the, the final result of Mr. Thanos? He does not want the job now, or he does? I guess that's my first question. I can only relate to you what it related to me. And I think the vice mayor summed up that conversation fairly well. So while I, um, I haven't received anything in writing, he told me he would send something to me um, indicating his withdrawal. And um, he also indicated to me exactly like the vice mayor said that he thought that serving at the, as a magistrate would uh, Created a relationship between with him and town that um, should should the need occur again in the future that that um, there would be a, a known working relationship. Um, and I'd like to add to the record because I don't think I stated it. Um, Mr. Thanos came in person this morning, and I was here early, and he approached me. That is when he spoke to me. I had no prior knowledge of this until just shortly before the meeting. I was here at eight thirty. He I did wish drive. He stayed to speak he to did. all of us. I would have assured him that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the council has taken an action, and the council chose him to be the attorney. As far as I'm concerned, he's our attorney, okay, and he'll have my we? full support. But I don't. It, it, this, this to me is a. It's very unfortunate. That's what it is. That's a. Would I, would council? Should we, since he has not formally withdrawn or send a letter, is it council's I, desire I for us to reiterate our support of, of yeah. his candidacy as an attorney? I, I would of think his that choice you, as an I'm attorney. sorry, Dennis, go ahead. Uh, you know, I think we need something in writing, first of all. Something, you know, I'm not doing. And then I think we need to make our move from there. But should someone from council uh, speak to him before something is in writing to reiterate our support of our decision? I'm asking for counsel. Uh, as feedback. far as I'm concerned, you know, he made a decision, he made a decision. I mean, I'm not gonna convince anyone to stay here. He doesn't feel comfortable for whatever reason. That's a decision he makes and he has to make it and he's made it. I'm not gonna try to talk him out of it if he's really uncomfortable doing it, and he must be uncomfortable or he wouldn't have said that. You know what I mean? I don't know. You know what, Joanne, I don't want to say anything else on the record at this point. I'd like to speak to Roger during the break, and, uh, you know, the council's already taken a vote on this. Um, we could even, uh, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't wish to say anything further on That's this. That's fine. And uh, I don't wish to say anything further I, either I don't want point. to, um, yeah. Okay, very good. So, um, but we still, we have, when is our uh, next magistrate meeting? Um, so, because. The 27th. Yes. But do we not need to put this out for an uh, RF, or, or did you, I'm sorry, we, Roger? We, we kind of, Amy handled uh, reaching out to various people to solicit letters of interest. 
including all the firms that applied to be the town attorney, assuming that we would have three who would not be selected. So um, I feel like we've uh, made it known that the town was soliciting for a special magistrate, but moreover, this position in sense in the sense works for work is one of these positions that works for the town council. So uh, you can direct us to do further outreach or you can um, ask us to get in contact with one or three people who you know are interested in and bring a contract back for your consideration at the next council meeting or but we, is there a we requirement? Don't. Is there? Do you have a requirement to do anything other than what you've done? I mean, uh, obviously, if if there's no special magistrate, we won't have a hearing that month. I mean, the cases get delayed a month. Basically, what would happen? Uh, until until right we had one. Public. No, I don't think that's correct to the public either. So that's why. Do you know with Ms. Roche, um, is she willing to do this on a monthly basis while we clear up everything else? Do you? Would you happen to know? Is that an option? I, I, I can, will tell you I did not discuss that with her, but I will tell you that um, there's a learning curve, et cetera, getting up to speed on the existing right. cases and all of that. And um, I would suggest to you that, that you're better off just taking the time, getting to the point where you're ready to make a decision about somebody. John? May I contribute? Thank you, John Turner. Um, I spoke with Mr. Madden. Uh, recently about his commitment and he indicated he was going to be uh, handling the special magistrate proceedings for this month and in October. Oh, okay. Because his, his letter uh, says the end of July. This was verbal. I'll double check and okay. try to get an email. That would be I great. asked him to get an email and I'll double check right now. That would be very helpful. That would be very helpful. Okay, so then we do not have to um, attend to this today uh, uh, we that have Roger, and if that is extra. not if it's not the case you'll bring it back to council and we will um, and you will let um, <clears throat> well I would uh, I don't know if, if John's gonna be successful reaching him right now but I would suggest that you um, make a backup this recommendation in the event that that the September meeting is mr. Madden's last meeting and she said she was interested in starting in October, right? My understanding. So as long, even if this is this meeting in September is his last one, that's still another month before the next hearing. We should towards the a, end of will be towards the, the end, of end, end of October. So that would still give us a couple of meetings that we could make a decision in. It would give us Roger time to get the other applications in of the people that he said are interested. Well, there right now there are no there's no one further who's interested who oh. other other than um, the three that I mentioned earlier. Bruce, pick her and go. I say pick her and go. She wants to do it, and it's not complicated by any of a myriad of issues that we have because Peterson Law Group is obviously still in contention as our attorneys yet. So. Um, the, the uh, I, I think we should go with a, a very qualified person that that wants it and doesn't complicate the other issues that we have ongoing because I agree with Dennis, uh, with Bruce that we have to you know keep moving forward well, with I agree the, with that too. you don't want to delay people a month I'm going to wait until I hear whether or not mr. Madding is going to continue through um, October because if he is then I'd, I don't uh, I don't want to uh, I don't want to jostle anything. One thing, I don't know what, how the rest of you feel is I don't know that we want to just leave it as an open-ended thing. I think we should make it for a number of years, whether it be one year, two years, three years, five years, and then determine whether we want to continue that relationship. So we're clearly waiting for an answer right now. Um, shall we move on to, can we um, set this one aside? We're going to leave this agenda item open for a moment, and we're going to move on to the monthly reports from Beachwater Community Development, Cultural Resources, Parks and Rec, and Public Works. And um, Roger, did you want to start this conversation, or how would you well, like to um, do this? Uh, we'll just, well, Madam Vice Mayor, unless, unless you want to 
to deviate from how we've handled this be fast we'll just go by department by department and see if there's any uh, specific points that we have to make to, to your attention or you have a specific question for that department so beginning with beach water I'll make the I'll make the first um, the comment about that report because although it's towards the end of the report I, I want to make sure that it's it's fresh. Here's Christy. It's fresh and it's fresh in your memory. You know, the Christy speak to any any other issues with the report. The very last item that we mentioned on page 86 is is a very significant item, and that is is that <clears throat> our financial plan is based on 4,700 ERUs. And today, as we sit here discussing, or actually the day Christy prepared this report. We're sitting at 4722.01 ERUs. So um, we have a very, very small um, surplus, if you will, at this point. Person gets 100% credit, and then we have to raise the stormwater rates on all the rest of us poor taxpayers, which is why I'm so adamant that everybody needs to pay, including Bay Beach. FYI, my stormwater fees should be going up because I put in some more pavers. You're welcome. Mr. Corey, for the record, we will take care of that for you. And, and I have an impervious pool. Okay. <laughs> Christy. Yes. Any, anything <laughs> specific other than what Mr. Hernstadt mentioned? Nothing for me. We took care any, of the Aberdeen. Any questions? And that was on my list. Thank you. Any other any questions for None Christy? No. Thank you so much, Christy. You. you know, we always get great compliments on the water department and especially, especially um, the individuals at the window who interact with the public. I hear always nice things and I often think, oh, if everything just worked out perfectly. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. They appreciate it. I'll let them know. Yeah, and it's a bill people are paying. So when they feel like they've been positively interacted with, you've really done a good job. So thank you. Um, next up would be then um, building official, community development. Roger, did you want right. to? Um, there's really nothing um, specific that we need to, to bring to your report of that to your attention other than, um, as you know, since April, we have taken over the building services function and um, we continue to try to provide a timely service to people who are uh, Applying for permits, we want we don't want time to be an impediment for people to try and for, to come in to to obtain a permit. Um, the ones that do hit a bottleneck, uh, if, if you hear of any of those, please bring them to our attention so we can look into them and try to get them resolved uh, as quickly as possible. We want to make sure we continue to provide a timely quality service from our building services uh, team. Our uh, uh, planning team. They also have been um, very involved in being available here to meet with the public and help them through their issues. And <clears throat> uh, Sarah and Jason, um, I believe, do a good job at that. And I think they're also extremely tuned into the council's sentiment that they don't want administrative decisions being made in the offices, that they want anything that has public ramifications to be brought forward to the LPA and town council for decision making. Uh, last but not least, environmental. I think everyone knows over the last six weeks, Ray and, and working in coordination with the public works staff has been extremely busy dealing with our environmental issues and uh, trying to keep the rest of their day-to-day -day work uh, moving forward on a timely basis. And I think um, and appreciate your the council's comments about uh, your appreciation of their efforts. So I'll stop there unless you have any questions. Questions? Yeah. One. Bruce. So on, on permitting, you're saying all the right things, Roger, and I really like hearing that about timeliness because that's, that's been a real agonizing problem for a lot of people over the years, going back to myself six years ago. Uh, is there some way of monitoring time, the turnaround times, the this where we have some sense that 80% of the permits were done in five days or, or by some classification of permits saying this group of permits 
we did this many and it took this many days and is there some time level of service that we can get some measurement on so that we can ex share that with people to s so that they will see that in aggregate we're doing a really good job here well I'll, I'll tell you for for 35 years I've been trying to do that and the short answer is we can produce statistics but the answer is no unfortunately and the reason for that is is that permitting is a function of not just town staff it's a function of the applicant right you got to kick it back and say you didn't do this right and and back, and, and what what you hear and I tend to hear is well I turned it in you know 10 weeks ago yeah but you, you turned in incomplete or 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 information that we can't proceed and and do a plan do a complete plan review on etc so um, you know it's one of those unfortunate cases where statistics never really present an accurate picture of what's going on but we can tell you how many have come in and you know and 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 um, how long they're what how long how long it's taking for them to pop out at the end of the pipe but what you can't do is take that number and really base a judgment at that you have to look at e almost each individual case and see why it took that long and whether that's good or bad you have to look at it because but yeah, you, you, I, I you have it. a mix of both. So let me ask this question. How many permits, in its early days, I know, how many permits come in that cannot be processed first time? I'll, I'll let Bob speak to that, but I would say, unfortunately, it's probably a pretty low percentage. <laughs> Robert Bogart, Building Department. Um, if it's not specifically an over-the-counter permit, such as a change out, a kitchen, sometimes can be an over-the-counter permit. But if it's not an over-the-counter permit, um, I would s probably say that half of the permits come in that are I've actually complete, that we don't have to go back and ask for something. They, we may have to ask for the NOC. We may have to have work for uh, look for contractors' licenses being voided or, or just um, expired um, we also have to look to make sure that the liability insurance is still active and so forth we have to have we actually have to have a form if they don't include that form in there that's another oh hey guys we need but uh, I would say probably 50% are actually complete that we can go through with the pro review process uh, how many? I'm sorry yeah. sorry to interrupt because I just yeah. something popped in my head and I just got to give you one example I'm not to pick on any one situation, but we actually had a case where someone submitted a, a survey and then whited out things on the survey, and that takes time to that takes time to figure that out. It takes guts too. <laughs> yeah. um, so you know, it, you know, it's there. There's the, the old sort of story that when mail used to be sorted manually, and the postmaster general would go around and and given a war to whoever throughout the country would sort the mail the fastest and they found this one guy in this one city who could throw the mail from behind his back and between his legs into the bin and the postmaster general comes and gives him the award of being the fastest mail sorter in the entire country and he says you think this is fast wait till I learn how to read so <laughs> so the point is is that you know there's a, there's a degree of due diligence that we have to do beyond just accepting stuff that's submitted on face value so how many over-the-counter permits are there versus the total permits percentage? Probably 10% of them, maybe. It's over-the-counter? It's over, just over-the-counter, a true over-the-counter. Now, there is one thing with the new process that we're moving into with our work and everything, the way that the contractors and uh, homeowners and everything present the permits in, they come in on a request form. Not a permit form all the permit apps are there but what that allows us to do is as long as it's it's a signal to the uh, applicant that if we don't have a permit number there was something wrong with what we sent in because we're not going to turn it into a permit until we actually have all the information it saves a step and actually believe it or not saves time in the permit application system uh, because they're not sitting there, well, I, I shoved it all in there, and, and they've got it. 
well, okay, I don't have a permit number yet, so something's wrong. But do you send them a note? Yes, sir. Yeah, they received they received notice, but I think one of the important things, and, and this is a learning curve for the people involved in, in dealing with building services, is now they can come make an appointment, come here, sit down with the person and say, okay, what's wrong? And they can sit down with or Bob or our or, or other technical staff and they you know, whether it's on the planning side or on the stormwater side or whatever the issue is, they can sit down and the person can say, right here on the plans, this is wrong. This is what I need you to change. This is what I need you to make it say. And um, people can avail themselves of that service versus the additional complication of having to go to downtown and trying to trying to do that that type of thing there. So, um, you know, we, we try not to get into an email, multiple email exchange with people who say, this is what's wrong with your plans, we, you know, and uh, if they don't get it the first time, we say, come in, let us show you. you know, we, when we're all looking at the same piece of paper, it may, makes it easier to point out what the deficiency is and get it addressed. Okay, well, ha having heard all that, I, s I still beg that we figure out a way to me have some measurements over time of level of service, not just how many activities we did. And uh, so I'm going to leave it to you to figure out how to do that. Okay. See, I know, I, and see I, we can I, come I, up with something. And, and I, didn't say that, I didn't say that we wouldn't. I just want to say that whatever the number is, even if it shows that we're doing great, take, you have to take it with a grain of salt because uh, of, the, of the nature but, of the but work. But I, I think with the new system and the people become familiar with it, now I realize you're going to have different contractors come in that hadn't been here before and there's new people learning all the time. But it seems like to me there ought to be some pathway of showing incremental improvement that we can express to the public over time and I, I just talked to somebody last night from their process started with Lee County on a swimming pool and they started telling me how many different times it got kicked back and why and I said geez that's terrible uh, why don't you go see Roger and, and Robert and uh, so they should be coming to you okay <laughs> but I know it was Lee started the process, and it's still in the process, but I encourage them to come see you guys to see if they could get some help. But anyhow, I, I think some level of service reporting is important uh, because this has been such a hot subject for such a long time. In every yeah. town, and, and we agree. Um, okay. Anything else? Yeah. And, and thank you for that because... Um, the town council has reiterated and, and with Roger, <laughs> everything we're doing is try to make it where the community feels that their government is serving them well. And um, hopefully that, that will help that feeling. Any any other questions for Mr. Bogart? Yes, I do. Okay, Anita. Um, Bob, um, 1046 Estero. I like the fact that it's still listed as the top of the mass parking lot because that's how I still refer to that property. <laughs> um, I just see continuing to issue tickets for operating a parking lot and it's scheduled for a hearing. What What is, what's happening with that other than, I mean, they're not allowed to operate that as a parking lot? I don't, that, that, yeah, that's, a, that's that, unfortunately it's a Jason issue. Um, my understanding of that issue is, is that the, the contention is, is that that parking is associated with the restaurant and Correct. can't be a paid parking lot. Yep. And that's what's being resolved through this ticketing slash appeal process. Okay. So so in a situation like that, does that property get fined every day? Right. Our position is is that is that it's not allowed to be a paid parking lot. We've asked them to cease and desist. They they feel that they're in the right to continue. So all of those tickets are a group of tickets that will all get resolved in one hearing one way or the other. Either we were right or they were right. Okay. Um, then I'm I'm uh, in complete agreement with with Bruce. There does need to be some some way that when somebody says, you know, I've had a permit in for three months and I've never heard anything, we we need to be able to verify that. But what I guess I'd like to know is, or, um, how do how should we treat someone who calls us and says, I need help with ABC because I'm not getting any action from the town. What do we do with that? 
Do we bring it to you, Roger? Do we bring yes. it to you? Okay. Okay. Um, second question is, Bob, is there like a, uh, when you said over-the-counter permits, I know some people are still trying to do repairs from Hurricane Irma. Um, if somebody came in with a Hurricane Irma repair, is that an over-the-counter repair? Or would it depend on the extent of the, of the work that was being done? Um, actually, both of those. But if somebody actually comes in with an Irma repair, um, that is a priority. I mean, that's, I that's we, I, I take that and I will walk it through the system to find out what they need, how they, whatever, to make it comply and so forth. So that, that would be a walk. It's not, not across the counter, but that, but we do take priority on, okay. on stuff like this, any type of emergency type work. Okay. Um, and what about recurring type permits that I would call, what I'm just going to say fences and pools. Okay. Is that an over-the-counter permit? It can't be over the counter because of the FEMA ramifications, your okay. flood and everything, the, the specifics on how a fence is built and mm -hmm. so forth. So, but it, it doesn't have to take the long route. With the way the system's set up, it will come in and it will go straight into flood review and zoning. And they will both look at it basically at the same time and then it can come out. So actually that should shorten the time that it used to take offense. Okay. By quite a bit. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. That's all I have for that. So, so just just speaking about um, to your question, Council Saracita, about what to do when people contact you. It's really important that, you know, if someone feels they've been delayed, whether it's legitimate or not, that they let me know because the outcome of people letting me know about, for example, they felt they were just taking too long to get their pool permits. Help us, help me recognize, and then the staff to address the situation that we had a, a glitch in our code that we had to fix. So, when I see those inquiries, it, I I can determine if it's a one-off situation or if it's a recurring situation affecting multiple people. And then we could step in and try to apply a, a you know a bigger band-aid to the situation rather than just fix one person's problem. I appreciate that, Roger, because, you know, I have brought something to you. I did bring something to you recently, uh, and it was an IRMA issue. Uh, I'm going to bring something to you on the break that's another IRMA issue from uh, a contractor that contacted me a day before yesterday. But uh, I don't – um, I'm always hesitant to – the reason I'm asking this question on the public record is so that there's never any impression that – oh, you're doing me a favor, I, because I tell people straight out, I'm not, you know, this is not a favor. I'll bring up, I'll bring the issue up, and if they can help you, and that's where I step out. So um, I'm glad that that's what you want us to do. Thank you. I'll throw something else in sure. here. Sure. I, I agree with Roger's input that he needs to know, but if it's building, um, if you can include me on the, in on that, I can get a half a step, and then whenever Roger asks me about it and so forth, I can furnish him with all the documentation. Great. It Great. helps me get a little bit of a step ahead yeah, of Yeah, sure, sure. And so. Joanne, if I could just make one yes. final thing. I really appreciate, uh, John uh, Guchard, if I could just, if you could pass this on. Uh, I, I appreciate having the uh, monthly updates from TPI. It, uh, it makes me... Uh, feel positive that things continue to move on, um, period. Right. So, guys, since, since the council raised that, let me just mention very quickly that uh, I, spoke, I spoke to the TPI team you know, once we got past the, the land development um, aspects of the project, and I told them it's very important that uh, to minimize rumors that they, they find a mechanism to get the word out to the community as to um, where they are in their project. The system that I worked out uh, ultimately with, with John was that he, he knows he can't speak at MMPs, but he would give you the report at MMP and then um, give you an opportunity to, once you read it, you can speak to them between meetings and if they need to, to provide a clarification or further information, they can speak at the ensuing council meeting under public comment and give a further update if, or clarification if that was needed. 
so that was a system that we worked out um, to try to keep the council and hopefully the public who uh, reads the agenda informed about the project uh, on a, on a re recurring monthly basis. Thank you. <coughs> Roger, you and I have talked about this before, but I just want to bring it up under the turtle number of violations and stuff. Uh, and one of the questions I've asked, because I've, I, I'm involved with three different people on a couple of items here. If something has been permitted, I mean, has been fine and acceptable for 30 <coughs> years, how, and there's been no change in the code, which is what you've told me, how is it all of a sudden a violation? <coughs> I, I just haven't never gotten <coughs> Like uh, that. Uh, Dennis, this is on my list to talk about too, so <laughs> just to let you know. I mean, you know, I, I, I've had three of my properties cited for things that have been in existence for 30 <laughs> years that already have shields and everything else on them. They've been fine for 30 years. They have made no changes, and all of a sudden they're a violation. And I need to, I need to be able to give these folks answers on why that is. <laughs> well. Um, complicated subject, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, we, we really need to get um, Ray Burns in here and um, hopefully educate or re-educate the council and, and by that educate the, um, the, the community on the whole turtle lighting issue. Um, it, it's um, frankly, a, a, a real challenge for us, um, and I know it's a challenge for for the beachfront properties because they feel like they're get in some cases they they feel like they're guessing what's the right thing to do. I believe they all want to do the right thing, um, and we haven't done a good job of making that really clear. You know, you would think that if the rules of engagement have changed, we would have reached out to the public to let them know that the rules of engagement have changed, and I fully understand the public's sentiment that if nothing, no one told me anything changed, and why what I've been doing in the past isn't, isn't, Chris Ray. isn't um, okay. So, Can I ask Ray that question? So, okay. um, Ray's here and um, to try to address what we have been doing with uh, turtle lighting and just before she speaks, uh, I just want the council to know that sort of I'm concerned about that very specific issue. If we have this number of violations, clearly we need to be doing more about education because you know this is something that unless you're a brand new property owner who bought your property last week, you were here for last year for turtle season, you should kind of know what, what you were supposed to be doing and we shouldn't be changing the rules of engagement on you. and and. It shouldn't be a, you know, a real community issue. So I'll let Ray speak. And Roger, some of these places have been in doing the same thing for 20 to 30 years. They've never been in violation. Why all of a sudden? None of the ordinance has changed. None of the lighting has changed. Why all of a sudden is it a violation? Well, to answer that question, there is a lot of different violations that occur every year. Ray Burns for the record. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Ray Burns for the record, environmental technician for Town of Fort Myers Beach. Um, so we whittle away at the different violations that we see. There's multiple, I mean, every time we go out, we're looking at close to 70 to 80 violations a night. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's only so much we can do per season for a property, and then we don't go forward with extra turtle violations outside of turtle season to give the community a break because we we don't necessarily need to have the lights on for turtle friendliness at that time. I still highly suggest it because that way there's no chance of any overlap with changing out lights, but it, that's not how the code is written. So um, although things may have been all right maybe 20 years ago. There is a lot of lighting that has changed in regards for technology. FWC, which is the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, currently does not allow for yellow bug lights to be used. 
they have come to the conclusion that bug lights are too old of a technology and they now only suggest amber or red LED lights. So although the code says 25 to 40 watt bug lights, that's not what the state recommends anymore, which is why we're, the staff is going through and making changes to the turtle code as of now. Um, in regards for why things might not be a violation uh, last year as opposed to this year, Honestly, it's just sheer numbers and trying to focus on the worst things that could cause the most violations and getting those abated and taken care of and just working down the list to whittle it away. For example? Um, yes. Oh, no, she just asked for example. For example? Um, for example, um, well, we can look at Pink Shell. Pink Shell has, ha it has a lot of lights. And we've gone through several cycles of Pink Shell where they've had, you know, weddings on site which have had lighting issues. We've had out exterior lighting become an issue that needs to be addressed and that thing. So you just work down to get everything to be as perfect as you can during the sea turtle season. Okay, so uh, here's my issue and, and we, we've talked about it and and since I live on the beachfront, um, I hear a lot about it. And the point is well taken. I, you know, there are properties near me that have done everything the same for 30 years, and now all of a sudden, um, here's my concern. I think that um, everybody thought bug lights were fine. We have a balance between human safety and turtle welfare. Of course. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but did, so, did, did, no, wait a minute. Um, okay. So we have things like uh, residents, I, I know a woman who's in her 70s who got two citations. One was for the light that goes up off and on on her step, which is set at the minimum thing, which she's allowed to have. But somehow they took the picture right while it was on and didn't time it, and she got a violation. And the back door light behind her house that's always been there, always the same, she got a violation. Or someone who uh, got a violation, they changed out a lot of light bulbs to yellow, then they were told no, the yellow doesn't work, they changed out all the light bulbs to red, then they were told it still wasn't right, someone was supposed to meet them and tell them what they're supposed to, they were begging to have somebody come out at night and tell them they drove from Naples up and were there at 9 o'clock when somebody was supposed to meet them the person didn't show up, they still haven't, and this person now has to go to magistrate. We, in my estimation, are not doing this well. I live on the beachfront. It's a cooperative effort. Every night, it's no fun when you've got the beautiful water out there and every night you gotta close your drapes and seal yourself off from it, especially me who's a little claustrophobic. So I'm living in my box, and I love the turtles and whatever. But even for me, I asked, while you're with a particular property, would you look at my house too and tell me, am I fully compliant? We shouldn't be giving violations. We're looking for compliance on behalf of the turtles and we're looking for compliance that also allows for safety. When you have a hotel motel, the next thing they have is trip and falls because people can't see down their steps. They, have a, they got an issue too. So. People want to comply. There is nobody on the beachfront that doesn't appreciate the environment of the beachfront. They've paid dearly to live there or to benefit financially from it for whatever reason. If it's a hotel, it doesn't matter. Everybody wants to comply. I'm very upset at the number of, that the number of people that I know, somebody who came home from the airport, turned their lights off and for, on and forgot for half an hour to close their drapes, they always do, and got a citation. Not a little letter saying, oh, by the way, did you know? Within half an hour of making a mistake on a private residence where they've lived for 15 years, they had a, a citation, not even, you know, and it's offensive. I agree. I, I've I'm I, totally with it. I've, I've talked enough. This needs to be a cooperative effort. We have to stop sending people to magistrate court for the lighting. We need, you need to, from my point of view, Roger, you need to have your staff work down the beach and do visits and say, we're going to be visiting your area of the beach on these nights, and then we're going to send you a note 
saying if you are or not in compliance overall and what we recommend you do if you do these things you would be in compliance and it would be, it would be the friendly neighborhood services environmental services approach because that's what we're looking to do i mean these aren't uh, sometimes there's not even a nest near these people i mean you know we have our lights off and everything all the way to the end of october the nests have already hatched we they're they're already long gone and we're all still living in the fear of having the wrong light or drapes open at the wrong time. I'm just it's saying ridiculous. what it is. <laughs> it, and, it, it, and the real problem is uh, that it's changed. And that's the point you were making. These are places who have been here a lot of years. And now all of a sudden we're doing instead of what a velvet something, we're, we're hitting with a steel hammer. And, and uh, that to me, that's not what we ought to be doing. I've said enough. Uh, but I'm hot on the yeah. topic, you can but, tell. You know, Sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> as most pe people on the beach call them the turtle Nazis, they would like to have the beach completely dark during turtle season. They don't care one dang bit about people's safety. They put the turtles above the people. And it's as simple as that. And it, like I'm saying, on one property, the lights have been shielded three sides all the way around them for the last 30 years with the exact same bulbs in them. All of a sudden now, they're in violation. That's, that's not acceptable to me. It just isn't. The, the code didn't change. And if it did, then nobody was ever notified about it. Now, how can you take them people and take them to the magistrate? That's just unacceptable. I agree with Joanne. There, that would be a, and, and Dennis too, I think that there should be, we should have a, uh, a kinder, gentler effort to bring about compliance. That's what code enforcement should be, period. It should be about compliance, not conflicts and magistrates and fines. It should be about compliance. That's what we ultimately want. It's, it, you know, for many, for many people, they feel like the town has a money-making effort with code enforcement. And I know that that's not the case, but that's the way it feels to them. And, um, and it, we should we should do a better job of it. I, I, and I, and I, one more point. I want to reiterate that um, I am uh, highly respectful and appreciative of all the people that are out. I see them out all the time, taking of course, care of the turtles of course, and all that. Of course. And I love them. We're a property that they know they can come and plant turtle nests on. They know if they need to move one, they're allowed to come to our house. We've had we had three this year that were transplanted at our house. So. I want that perfect balance between human safety and you know compliant and, and compliance of something that works for our turtle program. And that's what I'm trying to achieve. And right now, unfortunately, it's really heavy, heavily hand, heavy handed onto the properties in a way that I think is not proper. So, so I, I appreciate all of your comments. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we have these uh, reports on um, the agendas to give you an opportunity to give us this very important feedback. We're, we have to continue working on our code enforcement efforts, and in particular, cases where we have uh, repeat and, fr and flagrant violators versus people who just don't know, didn't, aren't aware you know, had an accident, someone left a switch on or something like that. So I will sit down with our um, team that deals with turtles and we'll take a look at our process and take a look at the code and be sure that uh, we're applying the appropriate uh, measure to the degree of the problem. And I, I would say, and I know there's this legal process that once it's to the magistrate, yada, 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 I have a problem with that. I, I know one who has to go to magistrate and has fines that may be piling up who asked to have a meeting and was there for a meeting and it would be paying a fine based on the fact that they were never had the opportunity to find out what they were supposed to do. That's wrong. It is wrong. And, and, and anything that you can do, I know that you have what you call compliance agreements or whatever. If you can please look at all the outstanding turtle cases right now and perhaps convert them to compliance agreements. I, I, you'll have to look at them individually. I don't know them all. I only know a handful of them. So that 
and and work forward to a better program that would be great all right so speaking to that specific point and I think that would help us deal with some of these outstanding issues and help us going forward one of the one of the quirks of our code is right now we're limited in when we can execute a compliance agreement and I think with your permission we will bring back an item to the next meeting if we can or is the very first available meeting to give staff a bigger window to to execute a compliance agreement with folks beyond what we have now. I, I think that's critical, and it's not just on this topic, but our community is one where people are gone for a month, two months, yeah. three months. Yeah. Um, if something comes up when they're out of town, I, I, there's a lot of reasons why that's a good point, Roger, and yes, bring it forward. Anybody else? Yeah? yeah. You know, Joanne, okay. I, I agree with the compliance agreement, but that's not going to help anybody that has to go to magistrate at the end of this month. Well, and, and yeah, the, and what are we going to do about those? Oh, yeah. well, I'll re, we, you know, we sit down and we review those cases, um, and then um, as part of getting prepared to, to make our presentation. So, in the case that the vice mayor mentioned, where the person made a good faith effort to meet with staff to try to resolve that particular case, you know, to the extent that that happens, we will we will either put the case in abeyance. I'll talk with the town attorney. Or with, withdraw the case if that's the, if that's appropriate or whatever. We'll review each and every case that's scheduled for the magistrate and make a determination if this is one of our uh, repeat flagrant violators who who knows and doesn't care versus someone who just didn't know or was out of town or had an incidental incidental issue happen that they our inspector just happened to be there at the at the right time or the wrong time depending on your point of view. I have a lot topic. more, but I've said enough for today. <laughs> uh, anything else for Ray so she can go back? No. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Um, all right. Um, that was – oh, I had one other question. We sort of hopped over into code enforcement. Um, I would sent um, – we would received an email, and I forwarded it to you, Roger. You said you were pursuing that, and that was they had asked about the two new lights at Nervous Alleys, and you were going to see if they were permitted and all that. Did we get an answer on that? I never heard back. My understanding is, is that um, the, there's a code violation associated with that light, that lighting, and um, the property owner of Nervous Alleys was in – the office, I want to say, on a Tuesday, if my memory serves me correctly, meeting with the code enforcement staff to discuss that situation. That's, that's been handled. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, are we on to our, anything else, or are we moving on to um, um, Mount House? I, I have another question oh, yes. before we move. On the short-term rentals um, data, when it sure. says the uh, – page 105 – when it says the number of condos, it says 548. If a condo is excluded or option out, I guess is the better word, right? If they option out, are they counted as one or yes, is it – so it is just one. I think it would be interesting to have that number as an aggregate number, including yep. all those units that were opted out. And maybe you have a different line for the opted out ones or something showing their units. That way you have a feel for how many – Rental units there are on the island? Yeah. Well, we, don't, we don't know that number, so yeah. let's just say you have a condo with 20 units in it. We don't know if there's one rental in that building or 20 rentals in that building. It's just well, all no, opted no, out or well, no license. No, yeah, but to me that means all those units are, are covered, whether they're rented or not. I guess is, is my perspective. Okay, I don't know that we'll have to, you know, if this really a separate process for someone to go in and try to establish all the units in that building, but we can. But would it would it suffice? Could add to that say, to the form Would in it future. suffice it just to say a uh, number of buildings that have opted out? We can is give you really a count of the number at? of buildings because that, that would opt be out. quick. We can give you even a list of the buildings that opted yeah. out because some of you may even know how many units are there, at least or at least yeah. picture it in your head how many yeah. units are there. Okay, that'd be helpful. Okay, glad to do that. On that, on that same subject, uh, I got a list uh, uh, from you the other day, yesterday. I think I picked it up of all the units in the buildings that I manage. And in one building, they have the same unit with the same owner twice with two different registration numbers. All right, so we have, we have some cases, and you may have seen an email from at least one property manager. 
where they registered the unit and the owner registered the unit. So we have some of those cases where. This isn't one of those cases. Uh, so I don't know, but I mean, I'd be glad to look at I mean, maybe the paid person paid us twice. I don't know what happened. We'll look no, at I, it. I'm just saying, though, there's one unit, same owner, same unit, and it has two separate registration numbers. Yeah. So well, I mean, we have to get that corrected because how are they going to know which registration unit to number to use? Um, well, we got to look into that if you forward me the particulars. Before we go to Mount House, oh, Allison's. Allison is, is not here. I'm glad to try to answer any questions you have. Um, the only thing I have is I just would like to state on the record, in case anybody's listening or the newspaper might report it, um, I noticed at the bottom of page 107, Allison notes that Visit Florida is offering free marketing opportunities for small businesses affected by red tide. And the Mound House is participating in all free, free marketing opportunities. And I just thought that it was good just to say that out loud that it's, that it's available for all small businesses. Yes. Anything else on that one? Let's see. Then we're to um, Parks and Rec. Sean had a ORCAB meeting this morning, so he's not here. Uh, <clears throat> I'll try to answer any questions you have about. No, I have nothing on board, Kev. Anything else? No, everything looks good. Thank you. Okay. And finally, Ms. O'Reilly is here. If you Yay, have any public works questions, they can take a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to? say the highlight or just questions? I have something that was not addressed in here. Um, we're working actually on a permit to do some paving like where Palm Avenue, uh, where the restroom was, try to get that and make some additional parking spots. Um, Connecticut Street Beach Access, make sure we're in compliance with ADA. Um, and then on the end of Curlew Street, there's a recurring pothole that's too large for our staff to handle in-house, so we're gonna pave that section. And that, that should be within the next two weeks, weather permitting. What was the second one you said after paving Palm Avenue? Connecticut, Connecticut. Street, Beach oh, Access. Thank you. Excluding the private property owner's driveway. Oh, yes. Okay. Now I understand. Yes. Thank you. I ask a question about street sweepers. I talked to Roger about this one time, and he gave me a lot of information, and I don't remember hardly anything. <laughs> why, <laughs> why do we have to uh, use the street sweeper? That's part of our NPDES permit as a having a stormwater system um, and being good stewards and, and trying to maintain and keep debris out of our waterways and our storm system. Part of the what? What was those numbers? NPDES. It's uh, National, National Pollution. National Pollution Discharge. Yeah. Yep. Permit. So it's, 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 um, this, uh, governments over a certain size required to have that permit. For it to, to show that you, you it's part of our requirement to put in a stormwater management system, and part of the maintenance requirement of that permit is you do some degree of street sweeping. I can provide that section for you if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A question on that. I thought the requirement was to either do the street sweeping or, or to uh, say why it wasn't necessary. I believe that may be so. Um, I can, like I said, I can grab that section for the for the next uh, monthly okay, report. Yeah, or email I, it to you. I, I just recall that, and of course, that's a matter of saving a lot of money if we're not street sweeping where it's not necessary. So, thank you. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Well, see, you and I had. Oh wait. Go ahead. Oh, okay. okay. If you're not done, go ahead. It's yeah. a different subject. Go ahead. Oh, okay. okay. Um, well, mine kind of is too, but. Um, you and I had chatted a, a little bit about possibly looking into putting a mooring field on the other side of the bridge. Has that gone anywhere? I'd like some further clarification and direction because that, that is, there is a possibility to do that, expand our mooring field from the 70 slips that we currently have. Um, and we could start that communication with the state and find uh, what would In, be needed. Well, you know, right now, I mean, all the north side of the sky yeah. bridge? I mean, there's, there's probably anywhere from 10 to 12 or more boats moored out there continually every day. Next thing you know, we're gonna have the same derelict area out there that we have on the other side of the bridge. If we just, even without a lot of expense, because I understand we have some extra mooring balls, it doesn't cost little to nothing to 
go to the state and be allowed to do that. And that way we can, even if we only put one or two balls out there, we declare the mooring field, that they can either park there and pay us or park on the other side and pay us and keep that one filled up. And that protects us on the other side of the bridge. Should we be asking the Anchorage Advisory Committee for a, a thought on that? I think, that? I think Anchorage should weigh in on that, but I, is our mooring field ever full? That's, that was yes. my other question. During oh, season? She said it is. During, During season? season, it is. We are During full season. at full capacity. So oh, well, good. Um, good. AAC does meet next week. So that is, if okay. yeah. your direction, we can pr bring that up. Yeah. I think so. Sure. Got a dozen boats parked over there. They don't want to pay the mooring field well, right. fees. Well, then they're going to have to go somewhere else or move to the other side and, and get in the mooring field to pay for it. And, and um, you know, the one good thing, uh, I have to say on behalf of this, there's some pros and cons, but don't forget with our water quality issues, when you're on the mooring ball, we have standards for pumping out. And I think that we really need to remember that, that that's our estuary and it's a protection for the estuary. So, um, yeah, is it direction of council then? Um, we're going to have a, the ACC uh, talk about it and bring it back yes. to a council meeting then? Yes, that'd be great. Because I just think it's, it's, it's a very minimal amount of money to spend to get it set up, and it protects us in several different ways. Oh, that's it. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to the short-term rentals for okay. a second. We, we have more. Let's, let's go back to short-term rentals in a minute. Let's let Christy, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Chelsea, I'm named all over the place today. Um, Anita, did you have something? Nothing. Continued. Good job, Chelsea. Okay. And did you have anything else for Chelsea? Did you have something else? For, okay. I just had one thing, and that's on page uh, 115. I noticed you said scheduling has made to, been made to have Lee County Sheriff Department come into the field every Saturday to do checks in the field. What does that mean? So it's my understanding. We met with Matanzas a couple weeks ago. Um, we receive pretty much every year a grant from WCIND, West Coast Inland Navigational District for mar Marine Patrol, additional Marine Patrol than the standard that they provide. Um, it is my understanding that back in the day, years ago, the, the field's only 10 years old, but back in the day, the Marine Patrol unit would assist the town because we would not be out there five, seven days a week, and they would assist the town with monitoring the field so uh, transient vessels don't come in and out on the weekends without paying the proper dues to the town. So they're going to be assisting and monitoring that because, as you know, Austin and the beach team share those duties with the mooring field and the beach. So we're trying to better utilize that grant and uh, patrol of the field. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? for? No. Okay. Now back to short-term rentals. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> My uh, question is how, do, how good do we feel about <coughs> renters or people that are renting property are aware and knowing that they have to register and what can we do to improve that? So, well, so the pro that, the, as you all should be aware, you, the council approved us uh, hiring a software company who begin to um, give us information about people who are advertising on the internet. Um, so we'll have that list and we'll then see if they're registered. The council, when you set up the rental ordinance, set up a warning process. So those people, we sent a letter warning them that they need to come in and get a registration and if they don't do that timely, then they would start into the violation process. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's like that. I didn't recall that. But wouldn't it also be beneficial to put a reminder in the water bills to that goes to everybody that say, hey, remember we're having, a, this is our new rental ordinance and you need to register for this. Um, we'll be glad to do that if the council directs that. I will tell you that I, I get concerned about the fact that, um, you know, when we set a precedent for one ordinance that we do this in a way of public information, you know, people are, are gonna want to expect us to do it all the time. This was not a, a pop-up issue that on, you know, we had MP on Thursday and on Monday it was on the agenda and we had a second reading and then boom, it was, was passed. This was something that was, was known uh, and, and discussed for months and months and months and months and months, perhaps even years. Secondarily, you know, uh, I own a property in another part of the state and I will tell you that I don't have the time to keep up with what's going on there all the time. So I pay a management company to do that for me. 
Uh, they take money out of my rent and they keep an eye on things and let me know if their laws change or regulations change or if I have to do something. So all that being said, um, we, 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 we believe that um, most people should know that there's an ordinance in place here in Fort Myers Beach. It was media coverage. It was, I mean, it would be pretty hard not to know. Now, that's not to say that someone doesn't know. And if they don't know, uh, clearly they'll be informed via the warning process. But if at the end of the day you would like us to put it on the water bill, we'll put it on the next available water bill that we don't have uh, another message on. Um, don't forget, there's no punitive penalty, too. So it's not like, well, if you didn't register by the state, the fee went up. He's flat, so they're paying the same thing if they register tomorrow as if they registered today. Uh, the fact that we're giving, that we'll give them a warning first, gives me some level of, of comfort with this. But I can give you two examples in my neighborhood. Uh, one guy lives in Germany, and he, I know he rent or used to rent over the internet, and he's he's not here. He doesn't get the sandpaper of every Friday at the, at the local corner. He's more than likely not going to get the message in the water bill either, Bruce. Well, I don't know. Somebody's got to pay the water bill. I assume he is. Well, he may be setting it up to pay it electronically. I don't know if he's no, actually getting a bill bill mailed to him. But I think, I think the point is that <clears throat> um, you know, you'll have to decide whether or not um, an absentee owner is the one you describe should just say, well, like if they don't tell me, I don't have to do it. Or they have some responsibility on their side, on their side to say they own an investment property here or whatever it is to stay attuned either personally or through intermediary as to what's going on. But to me, it's to our advantage in that we're trying to get everyone to be in compliance. And that, that's, that's the reason I'm saying that it's to our advantage to get them in compliance. We always want it. We always want to get people in compliance, but we also have to at least be intellectually honest with ourselves that there are people who are trying to hide from us. At least there are sure. some people yeah. trying to hide from sure. us. Sure. Sure. A lot of renters get paid the water bill too, because yeah. so, you know when they when you rent the house or the unit or whatever, they may say you have to pay the utilities, so it may never even get to the owner. Okay. Anything else on that one? No. Right. Anything else? No. Nope. Agenda management. Oh, yes, sorry. Sorry. Uh, just on this PPI thing, Roger, I just have a question. With the complaints that have been filed, if TPI comes in and applies for permits or, you know, to start doing stuff, uh, can we issue those permits or not? So, for example, um, <clears throat> they need a demolition permit to... That's different. I We're going to issue that. that. Um, <clears throat> what if they want to if they want to proceed? They they're fully aware that that they're doing that at their own risk, not necessarily knowing the outcome of the, those lawsuits. So if someone applies to us for a permit, we're going to issue it. Now things that the town has to do, uh, for example, potentially vacating right away. We're not going to do that till we, till we, uh, at least at, at the council level, until such time as we know the outcome of those I issues. I figured they could get the demolition permits. I was just wondering if they come in to start building something. They would be doing all that at their own risk if okay. they wanted to But we can that. issue. We can. Okay. That's all I was curious about. Anything else? Nope. I'm good. All done. Agenda management. Um, Roger, did you want to just take this on? Is there any, or I guess what we want to say, is there anything to add on? Yes, that's exactly right. I would like to add something. I, I talked about doing a um, kind of a town hall event for um, water slash environment, and I'd like the council's permission to work with Roger on uh, putting that together and then bring it back to council at uh, sometime ASAP. That, that would be great. And I asked Roger this morning, actually, because I know the mayor's at a water thing now, and I know yesterday she wanted an extensive tour. And I think that Roger told me, I'll just say it on the record, that she sent um, uh, an email to him saying that she had a, 
well-informed speaker that would be happy to participate. And Roger can tell you good. about that, Chair. Good. And so that's probably and so we may want to we may want a variety of speakers or whatever. But yes, it's what, okay what with I, me if you take what that I up. don't want to happen is I don't want another political right. or activist thing that is this just is scientific. This, this is this this need people need to know can they walk on the beach? Can they swim in the water? Are they need to know that kind of do you do you want to do that or should we have the mayor do it because the mayor has spent days out uh, Julia, she with is all so due respect do you know how many years I've spent on this issue <laughs> I mean I have spent years on this issue if 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 Tracy um, I'm fine with the mayor it, doing it. I know I, I just mentioned yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just providing like a courtesy to the mayor who has invested a lot of time that we have this discussion that's all insane and and Anita and you're fine with that and you're fine with that? Anita, you're it, our girl. Thank it, you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Can I just say two things, just to so the record is clear? So Phil Flood from uh, South Florida Water Management is, 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 the, is the person who is, was being discussed, and he's indicated to be more than happy at a, at a mutually convenient date and time to come give a presentation about um, his perspective on, on the environmental concerns we all uh, had over the last several months, and I, it's my understanding his presentation alone would be about 30 minutes. Yeah, so maybe that's a whole separate thing. Uh, he wants to give a South Florida Water Management District presentation. That's very different than what I'm talking about. That's the South Florida Water Management District, and if Tracy wants to work with him to schedule that, it's very okay, interesting. And would we I've do heard that? Before. And would we do that at Town Hall though? Is a separate thing on an uh, I think on that a would regular be a separate agenda? Thing. This is more. Okay, fine. I mean. Let me, if I could just, if you all have agreed, let me work with this, let work with Roger a little bit on this. I'm thinking uh, it to be more practical and um, people oriented. You know, what's happening now is that um, <coughs> people are looking for information and they're getting it from very weird sources because those sources are talking and we're not. Okay, yeah, so you'll, fine. Anita, you'll do that, okay. and then the Phil Flood might be a separate presentation. And that's a great any, presentation. Any other addition? Anita? No, no none, nothing okay. else for you. <laughs> Dennis? Nothing. Bruce? Okay, the only thing that I, and I'm just looking down real quick. Uh, um, I'm wondering, after the advisory committee reappointments, um, do we have a time for, set aside we've talked about having um, a session with all the chairs at least of the advisory committees or something and we certainly are way behind on any meeting with the LPA they usually were semi-annual I'm not sure what the LPA might have that they want to bring forward but I would just like to put on that we need to schedule our advisory committee things I agree, I agree. Just, just as a reminder we've scheduled a committee to speak at is it it's at least once a month or every council meeting, Michelle? Every council meeting. Every council meeting. Okay. So that the and the chairs of the respective committees are advised of those dates, so they know that they're on the My agenda. Time. And ba I mean, they may not show up and okay. report, but they have that opportunity and that time is reserved for them, so that they can come in and either update you on the uh, workings of the committee, any policy or, or, or issues that they would like council. Um, blessing on to pursue as well as to request a joint meeting with the council if they feel that they have an issue worthy of, of setting up that type of meeting so okay. all of that you is, know what that's a there's a point well taken um, but how about the LPA that the LPA is part of that process as well okay that sounds good I, I think that's a valid point so we won't put it on they they know that they can come forward to us and and request or do um, anything else yeah, Before we're I got done. To, for the town attorney, I, I got this from my boss. I'm sure you all did this this uh, Morgan and Morgan thing mm -hmm. for somebody that fell off the boat and got hit with the. How? Why are we included in this claim? John Turner, I was going to mention this the other day at our at town council meeting. Um, it really doesn't concern uh, the council in as a day to day um, matter in litigation. It is what was presented was a notice that the, it has to go through the compliance steps under the statute to put uh, any governmental entity on notice that there was a claim, a tort claim. As far as this particular claim is concerned, from my investigation, of course, we passed it on to the league. Let's let them handle it. Uh, that's what they do. And that's why we paid the insurance for. 
and I'm in the packet. I'm not sure why it was included in your packet. It wasn't in a packet. I got it upstairs in my box. All right. Well, why it was even there, I don't know. Other than I don't know. I'm just curious at how we would have liability in something like that. I think it's as obvious that, in from my investigation so far, that we do not have liability. That uh, it's a claim made and it will be dealt with uh, through the league. And if it comes back to us, we will be making recommendations that Thank will you. be appropriate. Thank you. Just for future reference, if you will. Um, there will always be cases where, where people will take a shotgun approach oh, I know. to, to uh, these types of claims, PI-type claims, and, and um, we'll, we'll get caught in the net and we'll have to defend ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Um, motion. I'm Vice sorry. Mayor, I'm, I apologize. I had one matter that I thought was going to be for a brief uh, advice as to an update. And if you would just give me just a second, I'd like to inform you that um, in the ADA issues on bicycles yes. and mobility devices uh, that uh, we are working with our consultant and we have some very good ideas and suggestions on how to deal with some of these issues. I don't want to get into detail but now. When, when do you think that might better. be ready for an M&P? Are we going to M&P that? Or? I, I would like to have an M&P rather than set it for the second reading, which is October 1st. I'd like to put that on hold, go back to an M&P, because we have, some, we have a lot of detail that you need to be aware of uh, what we would be proposing as well as working with Roger because it's going to take some staff time. Oh, when when do you think that would be ready for MMP? I would think next month. Okay, so October. So you you'll find a date, um, Roger, at some point. Right, well, we'll have the MMP in October. Yeah, we'll put it on. And then First, and then good. from there we'll we'll agenda it for a council meeting if council's ready to move forward. Very good. And then we'll take. That's scheduled for October 1st for the second reading. We're going to put that in and hold that, uh, table it uh, indefinitely until after the M and P. Okay. Is that all right? With That's the great. Council? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Turner. Um, a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Hey, wait, oh wait, we need a second. Oh, we have an executive session yes. at one o'clock. At one o'clock. Yes. But motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Vote is three zero. Anita has stepped out.